Well, my name is Paul Washer, and um, I am 47 years old. I was born in 1961 to a, um, a father who was an unbeliever, but a mother who was a, a strong believer. Her mother, Croatian, was actually persecuted for the faith. My um, grandfather on my father's side was one of the first missionaries to Brazil and um, served there in the 20s and 30s uh, when it was much of jungle and nothing else. Uh, so I was raised in something of a Christian heritage. Um, when I was nine years old, I made a profession of faith, and I even wept, but there was no real change in my life whatsoever. And as I grew older, I began to live in greater and greater ungodliness. Of course, being in the denomination I was in, because I had prayed a prayer and asked Jesus into my heart, I always believed that I was saved. Then when I, I went to college, I found myself, uh, after a few years, just at the end of my ropes. Academically, I was doing fine, but morally, um, I knew that, that I was a wretch. I knew that I was self-centered, full of pride, a liar, would do anything to uh, benefit self. And more and more, it was weighed upon me, just my wretchedness. And one night at about one in the morning, when I was contemplating how wretched I was, someone knocked on the door, and it was a freshman from across the hall. And um, he was trembling. And I asked him why he was trembling. And he said, well, you're probably going to punch me. And I said, well, you're probably right. It's one in the morning. And he said, for two weeks, God's been telling me to tell you something, but I'm afraid of you. But I can't stand it any longer, so I have to tell you. And he said, I have a message from God. And I, I literally thought, what is he, some kind of wacko or something. And um, he said, this is the message. God says that you are wretched and you are miserable and you will continue to be miserable until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And it was at that moment that um, God truly began to work in my life in a tremendous way. I was a very, very immoral person. Um, I always say there was nothing uh, noble about my rebellion. If you look up jerk in the dictionary, it had my picture there. That's all I was, just a self-centered, harmful person. And Christ began to work in my life, and um, eventually I was converted. And um, from there immediately, I felt a burden to preach, to preach, whether it was on the streets or soul winning on the street corner or speaking to my friends and um, began to just preach the gospel, what I thought was the gospel. I ended up going to seminary, and after seminary, um, I was greatly influenced by George Mueller and Hudson Taylor. And so I, I wanted to go to the mission field, but not with an organization, and without really raising support or telling people about uh, what God was doing. And um, my little Baptist church, where I was a member in Illinois, um, under their authority, it was a small church in the middle of a cornfield, I went to Peru. And God began to do miraculous things there. It was a very dangerous country at the time with the terrorist movement, the Sendero Luminoso, or Shining Path. War was on, bombs exploding, dead people in the streets. But God used all of that to begin to transform my life. But mainly I was challenged by an ex-Catholic priest to, uh, who had become an evangelical a Baptist pastor, to read the Bible just over and over and over. He asked me to teach a class in his seminary, and the first semester was the students had to read their Bible, um, the entire Bible that semester, and write their comments on every chapter. And so I began studying the Bible about 10 hours a day, and that is where my life began to change. I began to see that the gospel that I was preaching was not truly a biblical gospel. I had taken the, as Paul says to Timothy, the, glor the, the glorious gospel of our blessed God, and I had reduced it down to four little questions or five principles or four spiritual laws, and if someone said yes to every one of my questions and prayed a prayer at the end, I pronounced them saved. And I, I realized there was always a catch in my spirit when I would do that. And I realized that many of the people who were converted on the street with me never showed up to church, never grew in godliness. So I began to study the scriptures more and more. After reaching some conclusions, I came back to the States for a few months of rest. And there, someone presented to me Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, 
uh, many of, of the men who are most used to spread the gospel. Um, and I saw that the gospel they preached was quite different than our contemporary gospel. And it confirmed the things the Lord began to teach me. At that point, I had an insatiable desire to understand the cross of Calvary. And until today, 20 years later, the topic of most of my study is what has happened, what happened that day on that tree. And as I travel around the world and I teach on the cross of Jesus Christ, not something new, not some new revelation, but just the old classic historical teaching of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ bearing our sin and dying under the wrath of God to satisfy His justice so that God might be just and the justifier of the wicked, I find that even sincere Christians who've been walking with Christ for 20 and 30 years come up to me with tears in their eyes and say, I've never understood how the death of Christ truly paid for my sins, but now I do. I've always trusted in it for years, but I've never understood it. And so I begin to see that this country and this world is not so much gospel hardened as it is gospel ignorant. And it's gospel ignorant because we ourselves have reduced the gospel down to something that will fit in a track in the back of someone's pocket. And so that's more of the testimony of my life. I, um, when I was in Peru, we began supporting indigenous missionaries. And um, that has grown tremendously now to where we are supporting missionaries through an organization called Heart Cry, uh, missionaries around the world in about 15 different countries on four continents. God has greatly blessed that ministry. And that's where I spend most of my time now. If I'm not preaching in the States, I'm overseas instructing and teaching missionaries. Well, talking about revival, there's great misunderstanding, especially in the South, in the United States of America. People uh, will call me and say, we want to have a revival. Can you come and preach? Well, for the most part, revival is not something that you can create or make happen in a week of preaching. Another thing very important about revival is many people mistake revival for evangelism. That uh, we want to preach to the lost and see them saved, and that is a revival. Well, in order to have a revival, something must be made alive that has fallen asleep. So revival occurs primarily among the people of God. And so when we talk about revival, it is an extraordinary work of God to bring the people of God back to where they ought to be, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, living in obedience, and that obedience manifesting itself in love for God and love for God's people. Now, whenever there is a revival, there will also be the added benefit of an in-gathering of souls. But we need to think of revival as, first of all, among the people of God. And it has marks of things such as a passion for Christ. It has marks such as a greater desire for holiness. There will be a brokenness and a deeper repentance, but it's not a repentance unto death or desperation. It is a repentance unto life. The people who are most broken in a revival are, in the end, the, most, the people more, most joyful in the Holy Spirit. Now, there is something of a revival going on today. Now, the pop culture and media, and even most of the Christian media, they, they're not in on it. But what it is, it's an awakening. Many of the young people, I would say 30 years on down, are beginning, they, they are tired of what they are seeing in contemporary Christianity, and they're not seeking new revelation. They're going back to the rock from which they were cut. They're going back to the Spurgeons, to the Whitfields, to the Wesleys, and they're beginning to see the way Christianity ought to be. And I can see it throughout this country and throughout this world that we are seeing a return to the truths that bring about true and enduring revival. I'll talk for just a minute on, um, on revival and prayer. There are two extremes out there. There are people who say, you know, revival will come when God wants it to come. It's all in God's providence, so all your praying matters nothing. There are other people who think that actually through their praying they can manipulate the hand of God and bring revival. I don't agree with either camp. Uh, it is a mystery, the work of revival, but this is what I believe. I do believe that revival is a work of God's providence. And I believe that the first fruits of revival, 
And the means through which God brings revival is the praying community. Whenever I see a group of people gathering together to pray for revival, I'm not thinking simply that I hope revival will come, but I'm thinking to myself, here I see the first fruits of revival. And I do believe God's doing a work, and I do believe that revival of some sort will come. And I do say of some sort, because we don't need to put God in the box and think this is exactly how the revival is going to work out. Another important thing about revival is this. You cannot neglect the Word of God and neglect doing the hard work of the Word of God in Reformation and then pray for revival and expect for God to send the Holy Spirit to clean up our mess. The men who are praying for revival have to also be courageous enough to work for reform. If I tell any group of people, any group of evangelicals on the face of the earth that I'm praying for revival, they'll pat me on the back and say that's very nice. But, if I announce that for revival to come, there are many corrections that must occur in the church, and that the church is wayward, and the church is not following sound doctrine, and many things have to be changed, there is where the battle lies. And so it's not just revival, it's reformation. It's reformation. We have to clean up our gospel. We have to obey the commands of God with regard to our personal life and the church. And we have to realize that we are not allowed with the church of God to do what is right in our own eyes. But God has left us precepts and commands to follow. And I think that to the degree that we seek for revival, we must also seek to be submissive to the commands that God has already given us. When we talk about revival, as I've said, we've got to talk about reform. And there are some areas that are blatant that I believe needs to change. Uh, the first one is, is with regard to the sufficiency of Scripture. We cannot do ministry according to the anthropologist and sociologist and cultural expert. We have to do our ministry in the church according to the Scriptures. It's the work of the exegete and theologian to tell us how the church is to be run, not a questionnaire given to ungodly people to determine what kind of church they want. Another thing, there is a lack of teaching on the doctrine of God. Most people in America have an idea of God that looks something like Santa Claus and not the Yahweh of the Bible. Also, there is a need to return to a biblical gospel. We have taken the gospel of Jesus Christ and reduced it down to four little laws or principles. And if someone says yes to every question we ask them and pray a little prayer at the end, they believe they're saved. The gospel is about Jesus Christ bearing sin and dying under the wrath of God. He rose again from the dead on the third day, makes it possible for a just God to justify wicked men and continue just. And so we need to call men to repentance and faith. To repentance and faith. To give their lives over to Christ and to be a follower and discipler, a disciple of Him. Another thing that is very, very important in the church is with regard to, to conversion. So many people believe that they're honestly Christian because they prayed a prayer. But very few preachers are telling them to examine themselves, test themselves to see if they are in the faith. Because of that, we have a church filled with carnal lost people who sincerely believe they're saved because one time they prayed, again, a little prayer. Another thing that is very important is the reestablishment of compassionate, loving church discipline. God has given this as a grace to the church, not only to keep the church pure, but to lead to the salvation of souls and the protection of His people. We can't neglect that doctrine. Another thing that is extremely important is the family. We have allowed psychologists and sociologists to tell us how to build families. We have to get back to the scriptures and simply do what God has commanded us. Now, one other thing that is very important, and that has to do with the men of God, the pastors. They are not to be uh, life coaches, movers and shakers, great organizers. They are primarily to be men who dwell, who live in the presence of God and the presence of His Word on their knees. We need men who will return to their studies, who will seek God, seek His Word, live in prayer, and when they come out to preach, something comes out of their mouth more than just some little bit of advice on how to have your best life now. What comes out of their mouth is, thus saith the Lord. People are running to and fro in this nation, seeking a word from God. 
We need men who realize their primary responsibility is to be that of a prophet, to bring forth God's word to God's people and to encourage people with that word and to rebuke people with that word and to be in season, out of season, always doing the labor of a minister and a prophet. These are some of the great things that need to happen and I believe they are things that... I do not believe necessarily will bring revival, but they will be tied in with genuine revival and reform. Let me give a final encouraging word, and it is this. You can always tell the difference between the voice of the devil and the voice of God. When the devil speaks to you and points out your sin, he will always leave you in despair, discouragement, and he will encourage you to run as far away from God as you can possibly get. He will tell you there is no hope. When God rebukes a person, or when God rebukes his church, as we see in the nation of Israel, even if he says very, very hard things, he always ends his rebuke with an invitation of hope, an invitation of salvation that no matter what you've become, no matter what you've done, there is hope and there is salvation. Turn to the Lord and you will be saved. Have you heard the exciting reports of millions making decisions for Christ, of the church exploding and increasing in number? Well, we want to tell you about a secret. It's called the fallaway rate. 80 to 90 percent of those who are making decisions for Christ are now falling away from the faith. That means that modern evangelism and the methods it uses to bring people into the church is producing 80 to 90 of what we commonly call backsliders for every 100 decisions for Christ. Let me make it more real for you. A number of years ago, a major denomination in the U.S. was able to obtain 294,000 decisions for Christ. 294,000! Unfortunately, they could only find 14,000 in fellowship, which means they couldn't account for 280,000 of their decisions. And this is normal, modern, evangelistic results from local churches right up to large crusades. And we believe this tragedy is happening, not because of a lack of follow-up, but rather because the church has strayed away from the biblical way of presenting the gospel, the way Jesus did. So let's look now at how Jesus' approach was radically different from the typical modern methods. In Mark 10, verse 17, we have the story of the rich young man who runs up to Jesus and says, Good Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, I would be very excited. Mm -hmm. That would be a chance of a lifetime. Notice that Jesus does not say, Oh, my friend, you have a God-shaped hole in your heart that only I can fill. And if you will say this prayer and ask me into your heart, you'll get love, joy, peace, and go to heaven when you die. No. Jesus started by saying, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So he was correcting this man's understanding of the word good. And then he pointed him to the Ten Commandments. He gave him five of them. He said, you know the law. He says, you shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. And honor your father and mother. And the young man said, I've kept all those since my youth. And then Jesus pointed him to the essence of the first and second commandment and said, there's one thing you still lack. Go and sell all your goods, give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away, sad. And I'm thinking to myself, didn't Jesus know that no one can keep the Ten Commandments? We're not saved by keeping the law, we're saved by grace. Why did he talk to him that way? I mean, he didn't talk about God's love, God's grace, he didn't pray with him. He didn't even say something like, wait, come back. Would you like to come to my house this weekend for a lamb barbecue where I could establish a no-strings-attached, non-confrontational relationship with you? It seemed to me Jesus might have benefited from a friendship evangelism course. But that was my shallow and immature understanding of what he was doing. He was using a principle that prepares the heart for grace. It's a principle that has been used by Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, George Whitfield. 
And it, it converts the soul according to the Bible. It shows a person why they need the Savior. It's a key that changes everything. And that's why the enemy does not want you to get a hold of it. It's something that the enemy has bent out of shape over the years. He's misused it and even hidden it so that much of the church does not even know that it exists. That's why we call it Hell's Best Kept Secret. So please watch and listen carefully and don't let anything distract you. You can save the last thing that Jesus did. There's only a certain amount of time left. I left time left. The Bible tells us in Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. What is it that the Bible says is perfect and actually converts the soul? Why well, scripture makes it very clear, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now to illustrate the function of God's law, let's just look for a few moments at civil law. Imagine if I said to you, I've got some good news for you. Someone has just paid a $25,000 speeding fine on your behalf. You'd probably look at me and say, that's not good news. It doesn't make sense. I don't have a $25,000 speeding fine. You see, my good news would probably not be good news. It would sound foolish. But more than that, it would also sound offensive because I'm implying that you've broken the law when you don't think you have. But if I said it to you this way, it might make more sense. On the way here today, the law clocked you at going 55 miles an hour through an area set aside for a blind children's convention. There were 10 clear warning signs stating that 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed, but you went straight through at 55 miles an hour. What you did was extremely dangerous. The law was about to take its course when someone you don't even know stepped in and paid the fine for you. You are very fortunate. Can you see that telling you precisely what you've done wrong first actually makes the good news make sense? If I don't bring clear instruction you've violated the law, the good news will seem foolishness, it will seem offensive. But once you understand you've broken that law, then that good news becomes good news indeed. In the same way, if I approach a hardened sinner, someone whose understanding is darkened, and say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, it'll be foolishness to him and offensive to him. Foolishness because it won't make sense. The Bible actually says that. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing. And offensive because I'm insinuating he's a sinner when he doesn't think he is. As far as he's concerned, there are plenty of people far worse than him. But if I take the time to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it may make more sense. If I take the time to open up the divine law and to show the sinner precisely what he's done wrong, that he's offended God by transgressing his law, then when he becomes, as James says, convinced of the law as a transgressor, the good news of the fine being paid for him will not be foolishness, it will not be offensive, it will be the power of God unto salvation. Now with that thought in mind, let's look at Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So there's one function of God's law. It's to stop the mouth of the sinner. To stop a person from justifying himself, saying, ah, there's plenty of people far worse than I am, I'm not a bad person. No, the law stops the mouth of justification and leaves the whole world, not just the Jews, but the whole world, guilty before God. Romans 3.20 Wherefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there, the law tells us what sin is. In fact, 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. And then in Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, I had not known sin, but by the law. Paul said he didn't know what sin was until the law told him. 
And Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So there he's saying that the law is like a schoolmaster that leads us to Jesus Christ so that we can be justified through faith in his blood. The law doesn't help us, it just leaves us helpless. The law doesn't justify us, it just leaves us guilty before a just and holy God. Let me say that again, this is so important. We are not saved by the law. We are saved by God's grace through faith. The law just shows us we're filthy dirty and in desperate need of God's cleansing. And the tragedy of modern evangelism is that around the turn of the last century, when it got rid of the law and its ability to convert the soul, to drive people to the Savior, modern evangelism had to therefore find another reason for people to come to the Savior. And the issue that it has chosen to attract people to Jesus is the promise of life enhancement. The gospel has degenerated into Jesus Christ will give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. Now to illustrate the unscriptural nature of this very popular teaching, one that I used to teach myself, please listen to the following story because the essence of what we're saying pivots on this particular point. Two men are seated in a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on as it would improve his flight. He's a little skeptical at first as he can't see how wearing a parachute in a plane could possibly improve the flight. After a time, he decides to experiment and see if the claim is true. As he puts it on, he notices the weight of it upon his shoulders and he finds that he has difficulty in sitting upright. However, he was told the parachute would improve the flight, so he decides to give the thing a little time. And as he waits, he starts to notice that the other passengers are laughing at him because he's wearing a parachute in a plane. And as they continue to point and laugh, he finally can't stand it any longer. He slinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it on the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fill his heart because as far as he's concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is given a parachute, but listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment he'd be jumping 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts it on. He doesn't notice the weight upon his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without that parachute. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of both passengers' experience. The first man put on the parachute solely to improve his flight. And the result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers. He was disillusioned and somewhat bitter toward those who gave him the parachute. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before someone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man put the parachute on solely to escape the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him without it, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart knowing that he's safe from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Now listen to what the modern gospel says. It says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. And so the sinner responds, and in an experimental kind of way, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? Just what Jesus promised. Trials, tribulation, persecution. The other passengers mock him. What does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He's offended that he's been mocked. He's disillusioned and bitter. And how can you blame him? He was promised love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. And all he got were more trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed toward those who gave him the so-called good news. And now he's worse off than he was before because now he thinks he's given Jesus a try and all he got was a big let down. Another inoculated and bitter backslider. 
Instead of saying that Jesus improves the flight, we should be warning the passengers that they're going to have to jump out of the plane. That it's appointed a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And when a sinner understands the horrific consequences of breaking God's law, he will flee to the Savior solely to escape the wrath that's to come. And if we are true and faithful witnesses, that's what we should be preaching. That there is wrath to come. That God commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. You see, it's not an issue of happiness, but of righteousness. It doesn't matter how happy a person is or isn't in their current lifestyle, without the righteousness of Christ, they'll perish on the day of judgment. The Bible says, riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. You see, that's how I realized that I needed a Savior. I had many of the things that the world has to offer, but I knew that none of that would matter on the day when I stood before God and all of my sin came out as evidence of my guilt. It was the righteousness of Christ that I would need to be saved. Now, let me say that peace and joy are legitimate fruits of salvation. They are the wonderful, beautiful results of salvation. But it's not legitimate to use those fruits as a draw card for salvation. Why? Because if a person comes to God looking for peace, some joy in their life, but they're not broken in their heart, repentant over the fact that they've sinned against Almighty God, they won't find peace with God. They won't know the joy of the Lord. They'll remain enemies of God in their minds through wicked works, separated from God because of their sin. And if we continue to give people the wrong reason to come to Christ, they'll respond with a wrong motive, lacking repentance. Can you remember why the second passenger had peace and joy in his heart? It was because he knew that parachute was going to save him from sure death. In the same way, I have, as the Apostle Paul says, joy and peace in believing because I know the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver me from the wrath that's to come. Now with that thought in mind, let's take a look at another incident on board our airplane. We have a brand new stewardess, and it's her first day on the job. And she wants to make an impression on the passengers, and that's exactly what she does. Because as she's walking down the aisle, carrying a boiling hot pot of coffee, she accidentally trips over somebody's foot and slots this boiling hot liquid into the lap of our second passenger. Now, what's his reaction as this boiling hot liquid hits his tender flesh? Does he go, oh man, that hurt? Yes, of course, he feels the pain. But then does he stand up out of his seat, unstrap the parachute, and throw it on the floor saying, the stupid parachute? No, of course not. Why should he? He didn't put the parachute on to improve his flight. He put it on to save his life. And if anything, the hot coffee would cause him to cling tighter to the parachute and even look forward to the jump. If you and I have put on the Lord Jesus Christ for the biblical motive to flee from the wrath that's to come, when tribulation strikes, when the flight gets bumpy, we won't get angry at God, we won't lose our joy or peace. Why should we? We didn't come to Jesus for a happy lifestyle. We came because we had sinned against God and needed a Savior to save us from the wrath that's to come. And if anything, tribulation drives a true believer closer to the Savior. And sadly, we have literally multitudes of professing Christians who lose their joy and peace when the fly gets bumpy. Why? They're the product of a man-centered gospel. They came lacking repentance, without which you can't be saved. Think of the woman caught in the act of adultery. She had violated the seventh commandment. The law called for her blood. They were about to stone her. The law condemned her. And that's one of the functions of God's law. It condemns. Now you might say, wait a minute. That's not right. We can't go around condemning people. Well, that's true. We don't need to. They're condemned already. John 3.18 says, He that believes not is condemned already. All the law does is show a person himself in his true light. 
Some of you may identify with this. You've got a wooden table in your living room. You dust it down. It's clean, it's dust free. Then you draw back the curtains and let in the early morning sunlight. What do you see on the table? Dust. What do you see in the air? Dust. Did the light create the dust? No. The light merely exposed the dust. And when you and I take the time to draw back the curtains of the Holy of Holies and let the light of God's law shine upon a sinner's heart, all that happens is that he sees himself in truth. The commandment is a lamp and the law is light. That's why Paul says in Romans 7 verse 13, by the commandment, sin became exceedingly sinful. In other words, it was the law that showed Paul's sin in its true light. This next clip shows how little some people know about God's law. Can you name any of the Ten Commandments? Um, not to kill, thou shalt not kill. I know stealing's one of them. Let's see. Ten Commandments. I think there's ten of them. Okay, I don't know. Do you know any of the Ten Commandments? And I don't know anymore. Can you name the Ten Commandments? No. Give me one. Miller, Miller Lite, Bud, Bud Lite, Corona, Heineken, Heineken, Budweiser, Old Style, uh, Red Zar, Bush, Red Wolf, Nestle Lite, Guinness, Foster's, Back. While that may seem funny to some, it's a sad reality that many people today know more about beer than they do about the Ten Commandments, God's moral standard. If someone does not know God's law, they will not see their sin as being exceedingly sinful, and their heart will not be prepared for the gospel. It's as simple as this. What farmer would take good seed and cast it on hard soil? Now firstly, he prepares the soil, he breaks it up, good seed, good soil, good harvest. And what modern evangelism does is it takes the good seed of the gospel and casts it on the hard, unregenerate heart of humanity. Biblical evangelism, without exception, is always law to the proud, grace to the humble. Never will you see Jesus giving the gospel, the good news, the grace of God to a proud, arrogant, self-righteous person. No, with the law, he breaks the hard heart. With the gospel, he heals the broken heart. Why did he do that? Because he always did those things that please the Father. The Bible says God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Let me put it another way. What doctor would give a cure to a patient when the patient's not first convinced of his disease? Imagine I'm a doctor and I say to you, I've got this wonderful cure, but you're not convinced of the disease. You're going to pour it down the drain. And why shouldn't you? You don't appreciate it and there's no point in appropriating it. But if instead I say to you, you've got a terrible terminal disease, sit down. I can see 10 clear symptoms on your flesh. You're going to be dead in two weeks. And you say, oh, what should I do? 
Then I say to you, oh, don't worry, I've got a cure. Then you're going to grab it, you're going to appreciate it, and you're going to appropriate it because you've seen the disease that you might appreciate the cure. The disease is sin, and the cure is the gospel. And if we care about people, we must take the time to first help them see that they have the disease and help them understand the serious consequences of sin before Almighty God so that they will appreciate the cure of the gospel. I'd like to share with you now how I share my faith personally, how we put these principles into action. I love to read about how Jesus shared the gospel. And there's a beautiful example in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, demonstrating how Jesus interacted with this woman. We like to call it the way of the master. It shows Jesus first relating to this woman in the natural realm, talking about natural things. And then he swings to the spiritual realm, talks about spiritual things. He brings conviction using the seventh commandment and then reveals himself as the Messiah. And I'll try to follow in his footsteps, so to speak, by talking with someone about everyday things and then deliberately swing to the subject of God. And sometimes I do this by bringing up uh, something religious that's occurred in the news, uh, just a general question like, hey, you ever think about what happens when you die? Hey, do you believe in God? Do you know any good churches around? Or I'll use a good gospel track to bring up the subject of spiritual things. I did this uh, not too long ago. I was on the golf course with uh, a friend of mine. And uh, we got on the subject of the things of God, and I asked him, I said, you believe in God? And he says, yeah. And he says, um, yeah, I used to go to church when I was a kid. And then I asked him, would you consider yourself to be a good person? And he said, yeah, I do. And then I asked, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And remember, that's what Jesus used, the Ten Commandments, with that rich young ruler. And this man said to me, well, I've kept most of them. I mean, I've never murdered anybody. And I'm thinking, well, that's a good thing out here on the golf course. And I said, well, have you ever lied? And he said, yeah, of course. And then I said, what does that make you? What are you called? And he said, a liar. And then I said, have you ever stolen anything? That's the Eighth Commandment. And he said, uh, no. And sometimes I'll say to him, come on, I'm not sure I believe you. You just admitted to me you're a liar. And he said, okay, okay, okay. I did when I was younger. Yeah, I've stolen a few things. And then I asked him, are you familiar with the seventh commandment? You shall not commit adultery. But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Have you ever done that? And this man said, oh yeah, plenty of times. And then I said to him, by your own admission, you're a lying thief and an adulterer at heart. And that's only three of the Ten Commandments. There's seven more pointed at you. You should have seen the look on his face. Well, he looked guilty because he knew he was guilty. And that's what the commandments do. They leave the whole world guilty. I mean, think about it, even for you, sitting right where you are. Do you think you've kept God's commandments? Look at the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus said to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength so much that your love for everyone else is like hatred compared to your love and devotion for God. Have you always loved God that much? Or the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Now, you can either make a false God with your hands or with your mind. Have you ever said something like this? My God is a God of love and mercy. He's not a God of judgment and would never send anyone to hell. Well, if you've said that, you're right. Your God never would send anyone to hell because He couldn't. Because He doesn't exist. He's a figment of your imagination. You've created a God in your own mind that you're more comfortable with. You've created a God to suit your sins. It's called idolatry. And many people call that simply their own beliefs, but the Bible calls it idolatry, and idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Or the third commandment, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word to express disgust? Something called blasphemy. Jesus warned every idle word a man speaks, he'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And the Bible says the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
I went for 22 years as a non-Christian knowing that God had given me life and never once did I say God you gave me life what do you require of me one day in seven I violated that commandment or the fifth honor your father and mother have you always honored your parents implicitly in a way that's pleasing in the sight of God or the sixth commandment you shall not kill or murder most of us think we're innocent with that one but Jesus said whoever is angry with his brother without cause is in danger of judgment and the Bible says he who hates his brother is a murderer we've already looked at the seventh the eighth and the ninth and who of us can say that we're not guilty of violating the tenth commandment coveting or being jealous greedy for things that belong to other people and remember God even sees our thought life and the secret deeds done in darkness. James 2.10 says, He who keeps the whole law and violates it at just one point is guilty of all. Can you see how the commandments leave us all guilty? My friend could see that on the golf course and so I asked him, If God were to judge you by the commandments, would you be innocent or guilty? He said, guilty. I said, so does that mean that you'd go to heaven or hell? And you know what he said? He said, heaven because God is forgiving you just need to ask him and I said to him man try that in a court of law you're standing before a judge guilty of a serious crime and the judge says what do you have to say before I pass sentence and you stand up and say judge I just like to say that I believe you're a good man and therefore you'll let me go is the judge gonna let you go if he's a good judge of course not He'll probably say, because I'm a good man, I'm going to see that justice is served. Because I am a good man, I'm going to see that you're punished for what you've done. And the very thing that many people are hoping will save them on the day of judgment is the very thing that will condemn them. Because if God is good, then by nature, He will make sure that justice is served and that people are punished for what they've done. And the Bible says that God will punish sin wherever it's found. He'll punish murderers and rapists, but He won't stop there. God is so good, He'll also punish liars and thieves, adulterers, blasphemers, and all those who violate the inner light that God has given to every man. So I said to my friend, if God gave you justice, you wouldn't be headed for heaven, would you? But for hell. It's when He hung His head and His mouth was stopped that I knew the law, the commandments, had done their work and he was ready for grace. I said, man, I want to tell you some great news. Put yourself in a courtroom. You're guilty of a serious crime with a million dollar fine or life in prison. You can't pay your fine when all of a sudden someone comes into the courtroom and pays your fine for you. I said, that's what God did for you and for me 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ stepped into the courtroom, so to speak, and paid our fine when He suffered and died on the cross. The Bible puts it like this, God demonstrated His own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We broke the law and Jesus paid our fine. It's as simple as that. And then He rose from the grave and He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And then I told Him, God commands Him to repent and put His faith in Jesus Christ. We got to the end of the golf course and he put his, his face in his hands and began weeping in the middle of the parking lot crying out to the Lord to forgive him. It was a beautiful thing and he said to my wife the next day that was the best day of my entire life and golf had nothing to do with it. Please watch carefully as Ray uses the commandments in this clip to help a person see the disease of sin before he offers the cure of the gospel. Okay, can you name any of them? Um, yes, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not... Oh, hold on, I, I know. Yeah. You know a few. Yeah, I know. Now, do you think you've kept those Ten Commandments? Um, yes. Okay, have you ever told a lie? Well, at some times, you know, most every human does. So you broke that one? Yes. So what are you called if you tell a lie? A liar. Uh, have you ever stolen? No, sir, I haven't. Even something really small? Be honest before God. Well, I guess a little stuff. Like, okay. maybe like a piece of gum or something. Oh, just a piece of gum. So what does that make you? Uh, 
Oh, a stealer, I guess. Thief. See, the value of the thing you steal doesn't make any difference. If I open your wallet and just take out one dollar, it's as bad as taking out a hundred dollars. I'm a thief. And Jesus said, if, you, if we look at a woman and lust after her, we commit adultery with her in her heart. You ever done that? Um, no, sir. I, You've sorry. never looked at a woman with lust? Oh, well. <laughs> your friend over there is laughing at you. He doesn't think you're speaking the truth. Well, I mean... Yes, I have looked at a woman, you know. So you've told another lie. All right. Yes. So you've really blown it, haven't you? So you've broken three commandments. We've only looked at three. We haven't looked at the other seven. And you ever used God's name in vain? Yes, sir. So instead of using a four-letter filth word to express disgust, you've taken the name of the God who gave you life and used his name as a curse word, which is called blasphemy. So on Judgment Day, when God judges you by that standard, are you going to be innocent or guilty of breaking his commandments? I'll be guilty of that one. Do you think you'll go to heaven or hell? Um, well, I think, think I'd probably go to heaven in the sense that that's, that's one thing that from now on I'll try to improve myself and that God might forgive me for, all my, for the sins that I've broken from that. So do you think God should let murderers and liars and thieves and adulterers into heaven? I guess not. So you're in big trouble. Really, you're heading for hell, aren't you? Yeah. Does that concern you? Yes. Yes, it does. Because there's nothing more valuable, more valuable than your life, is there? Would you sell one of your eyes for a million dollars? No, sir. Because your eyes are precious to you, aren't they? And they're the windows of your soul. Your soul or your life looks out those, those eyes. Now, Jesus said, you're to despise the value of your eye compared to the value of your soul. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, Pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's better to enter heaven without an eye than go to hell with both your eyes. And do you know why Jesus died on the cross? Why he did? For, uh, for sinning. Sinning? Well, he died for our sins, for the sins of the world. Of, of everybody around the world, like he was sacrificing himself for everyone else. Now, do you know how to uh, partake in that gift of salvation? Do you know what you should do? No. Well, if you were on a plane and you knew you had to jump and there was a parachute under the seat, what would you do? I would take the parachute. Put it on. You wouldn't just believe in it, would you? You'd put it on. Yes. That's exactly what you have to do with Jesus. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to repent, that is, turn from your sins once and for all, and put your faith in Jesus the same way you put your trust in a parachute. The moment you do that, the Bible says you'll pass from death to life. You'll come out of darkness into light, and you'll receive God's gift of everlasting life. Perhaps you're a professing Christian and you're beginning to doubt the motive for your salvation. Well, the Bible says examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. And if you're not sure, make your calling and election sure. Go somewhere quiet, confess your sins to God, open the Bible at Psalm 51 and make it your own penitent prayer. We really want to thank you for taking the time to listen carefully to this teaching. Now, if you have questions, be like the Bereans and search the scriptures to see if these things are true. See you next time. Let's just go for just a moment. Go over to Genesis just quickly with me. Chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Only evil continually. 
I simply read this text one time preaching at a university and a young reporter came up to me and he said, I don't agree with your interpretation. And I said, young man, I didn't interpret the text, I read it. And he said, well, I don't agree. And I said, young man, let me tell you something. If I could pull out your heart right now, if I could take every thought you have ever had from your first waking moment until this very hour, if I could take every thought you've ever had, not just your deeds, but your thoughts, only your thoughts, and I could put them on a video, and I could show that video here in this auditorium tonight, you would run off of this campus and you would never show your face here again because you have thought things so wicked and so perverted you cannot even share them with your closest friend. As a matter of fact, if your closest friend knew some of the thoughts you've had against him, he would no longer be your friend. And young man, I do not know that because I'm a prophet. I know that because it's what the Scriptures say, and I know that like you, I too am a man. I can say the same thing about every one of you here tonight. You would spend every ounce of energy to hide from everyone in this room what has gone through your mind just in the last hour. Don't tell me Scripture's not right when it talks about all men having sinned because all men are sinners. Go to Genesis 8 for a moment. Verse 21, And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to Himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. This can mean evil from childhood. Evil from a babe. Let me share with you something that a correction officer said a long time ago. He said this, Discovered that human nature is such that imagine for a moment an 18-month-old baby that you're holding in your arms. And that 18-month-old baby sees that shiny watch on your wrist. And he grabs for your watch. And you pull his hand away and say no. He begins to cry and move about in your arms. He reaches for the watch again. You grab his hand and say no. He begins to scream and cry. He reaches for the watch again. You say no. He begins to frail his arms even in the direction of your face. I submit to you that if that 18-month-old baby had the strength of an 18-year-old man, he would slaughter you there where you stand, Father. Rip the watch off your arm and walk across your bloody body out the door without feeling an ounce of remorse. You see, here's something you need to understand. Hitler was not an anomaly. Hitler was not a phenomenon. Hitler was what everyone in this room has the potential of being. And not only that, you need to understand, even in all the, all the wickedness of Hitler, Hitler was still restrained by the common grace of God. And you need to know this, that if it were not for the common grace of God restraining you in your unconverted state, you would make Hitler look like a choir boy. What we do not understand is what Scripture teaches about men. Men are evil. You say, well, I don't agree. That's because you've grabbed enough of Christianity to stand, but you don't believe the Bible. The Scripture's testimony against you and all men is that we are born with evil. And we are evil. Do you have to teach a child to lie? Do you have to teach a child to be self-centered? Do you have to teach a child to be selfish? Do you have to teach a child to be brutal to other children? They learn that on their own. Set them free. Discipline them not and see what you have in ten years. A monster. Why? Because what Scripture says is true. And you hold your ears and you say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. In the same way that a person dying of cancer is in denial and says to the doctor, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But by cupping the hands over your ears, you close yourself off from any remedy. The first thing you must embrace is this. All men are born in sin and given over to sin. And all men are born hating God. You say, well, I never hated God. Yes, you do. If you did not, if you did not and in your, in your unconverted state hate God, then the Bible is not true. Because the Bible calls all men haters of 
God and enemies of God. You say, but I loved God ever since I was little. No, you loved an image of God that you created with your own mind and you loved what you made. But if someone would have come to you and pointed out the God of Scripture, you would have said, I could never love a God like that. So many times I'll go to people and they say, well, I've loved God all my life. And I say, can I sit down with you for a half an hour and just explain from Scripture some of the historical Christian beliefs about God? And after a half an hour, a good churchman will say, that's not my God. And I have to say, of course it's not. But it is the God of Scripture. It is the God of Scripture. Let's take another look. Let's go on over to Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy garments, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I helped build a church years ago in San Pablo, near the Colombian border on the, on the Amazon. And it was a colony of lepers. Have you ever seen a leper? Have you ever smelled a leper? If I brought a leper of the worst sort, there's about three different kinds of leprosy. If I brought a leper of the worst sort, you'd smell him before he got out of the parking lot into this building. If he walked in here, he would be a mass of rotting flesh, body fluid, pus, and blood. When he said all of us are like one who is unclean, this is possible to reference here. And let's say that all you find people say, well, we must do something about this. So you go to Kansas City, to the most exclusive shop, and you buy the most fine, some finest silk you can find. And you take that silk, and you bring it back, and you wrap that man head to toe in that fine white silk, and you say, bravo, look what we've done. We've saved the day. We've made him presentable. But that silk only lies on that flesh for a few seconds. And the corruption of that man's body begins to bleed through that fine silk. And that silk becomes as corrupt as the man himself. That is why all our good works are like filthy rags before God. Because we ourselves, prior to conversion have a heart of stone, a God-hating heart, a heart of evil, born in sin, given towards sin. That is the testimony of Scripture. Some of you, in your 60s, 70s, you heard preaching like this all the time when you were children. But now it seems the new generations to follow cannot bear with truth. They would rather be deceived and think well of themselves. But a man who will not accept his illness cannot be healed. A man who does not have all his hopes crushed with regard to his own self-righteousness, merit and worth cannot turn to Christ. We must realize that we are destitute and there is only one Savior and His name is Jesus. Now let me share something with you for Christians who struggle with uh, kind of sadness and looking at yourself and always really feeling down. The more you know God, the more you're going to see His holiness. The more you see His holiness, the more you're going to see your sin, which leads you to deeper depths of conviction, contrition, and mourning. But if that's all you see, you're in trouble. But with that greater revelation of God's holiness and that greater revelation of your sin also comes a greater revelation of what God has done for you in Christ and that unconditional love and that grace abounding to the chief of sinners. So although, you're you're almost like a paradox, the more you walk with Christ, the deeper is your contrition and mourning over sin and yet greater your joy and there's a transmission that goes on. No longer is your joy found in your own performance, but it's found in the finished work of Christ. So if the devil walks in, starts pointing out all kinds of things about you, you yawn. And you go, you don't even know the half of it. This has never been about me. Have I ever said this was about me? This is not about me. I don't hope in me. 
If my hope was in me, you could kill my hope with a dagger right now. The smallest penknife would take down my hope. But my hope's not in me. It's in my older brother. And if you don't leave, I'm going to call him. You don't want me to call him. Oh, believers, I want you to know something. People sometimes, young men will come and they'll go, you know, they look at, at guys who preach in a lot of places around the world and stuff, and all these young guys think, man, this guy, he reached some spiritual level, and because he reached that spiritual level, God really uses him. No. No. The older you get, the more needy you become of grace. And the more happy you are in Christ alone. The older you get, the more of your sin you see. And you trust not in the flesh. You glory in Christ Jesus. And when all, all your everything is based upon His perfect work, as weak as you might be, you're as solid as a rock. Because the devil can't touch Him. The devil can't touch Him. A young guy one time, he calls me up. He was a seminary student. He was just saying, Brother Paul, he wrote me. He goes, I'm so ungodly and I'm so unrighteous and I'm so this and that. And I knew the young man. He was a fine, sincere Christian. And he was just so struggling. He said, I'm so ungodly and ignorant. And I wrote him back and I said, Dear brother, you are much more ungodly and much more ignorant than you now know. Love your brother Paul. I have the gift of mercy and encouragement. <laughs> and so he calls me up on the phone and he goes, uh, Thanks. And I said, look, I've watched your life. In many ways, you seem to have made greater progress than I have. But I'm happier than you. And he said, why? I've given up on trying to find hope in my performance. And all, all, everything for me is in the unconditional love of my Savior. If you know anything about the ministry that the Lord's given me, you probably, if you've heard anything, you go, man, that guy just talks about sin, sin. He nails people. He's the meanest preacher that ever walked the planet. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to unbelievers who are professing faith in Christ and they're asleep in their sin and they're going to die and go to hell, yes, I am going to rip, 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 because it doesn't appear to me that hardly anyone else is doing that. I am not going to let them go to hell except over my cries that they wake up and see their destruction. But when I pastor, sometimes people come to church if I'm preaching and they go, are you the same guy on YouTube? Because all you do is talk about love, 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 love. Why? Here's the reason. If the person truly becomes converted, I don't have to do anything. They're sheep. They're going to follow Him. As a shepherd, you know what my greatest worry is for the people who are truly converted? I don't want them coming under false condemnation. And I don't want them doubting the love of God. You see, the whole deal depends on conversion. Do you see that? You get them converted, and you talk to them about the unconditional love of God, you know what they'll do? I'll tell you what they won't do. They won't stand there and go, well... If it's like this, let's just sin. Now, you tell a true sheep about the unconditional love of God and that it doesn't matter what they do or how far they fail. Christ loves them and is going to restore them and work in them. And a bruised reed He will not break and a smoldering wick He will not put out. You tell them that, they say, well, if it be like that, then I want to love Him more. I want to serve Him more. I want to follow Him. If I'm really free, you see? So all you have to do is get converted and I'll be nice to you. <laughs> but here's another thing. If I'm preaching on the streets in a place where everybody's just wild and wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah on this present day planet, I stand up and I preach the love of God. The time for preaching hard is when people have become deceived by religion and when they think they're something they're not, and when most of the religious authorities in the world are affirming them in their false conversion. And for self-preservation, those preachers are saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And people, they are building their huge churches on the bones of carnal dead church members. And now, 
and go to the garden for a moment. Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Drops of blood sweating coming from His brow. Father, let this cup pass from me. These preachers, they say, oh, Jesus didn't want to go to that Roman cross. That's a lie. Oh, Jesus, He's charismatic preachers. Jesus was afraid of the devil. Blasphemy. Oh, that Roman cross, that whip, He didn't want to go to it. Absurd. Let me ask you a question. Just for a second. I want you to think about this for just a moment. After the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, since that time, it is estimated that 50 million men and women and children have died for their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. They've died as martyrs. In the early church, through up through the time of the Puritans and the Reformation, do you know, let's just use the early church for example, many of Jesus' followers were crucified. Not only crucified, they were crucified upside down. Not only crucified upside down, they were pitched, filled, covered with pitch and set on fire to provide lights for the streets of Rome. But many of those followers of Jesus, in chains being taken off to be crucified, sang hymns full of joy. Do you honestly believe the captain of our salvation is in a garden, cowering because of a cross, even though his disciples went to the same cross with joy in their heart? Do you think that the captain of our salvation is so weak? Think, man. Jesus wasn't afraid of a cross or a nail or a spear or a crown of thorns. What was in the cup? I'll never forget it at a Reformed school, theologically Reformed school several years ago. I went there and I said, well, I'm, you've, you've called me here to preach. I'm here. And they said, you'll be preaching out in the auditorium. I said, wonderful. What ages? And they said, well, kindergarten to the twelfth grade. And I said, well, I'm going to be teaching on propitiation. It's kind of a wide berth, don't you think? They said, it won't be a problem, Mr. Washer. So I walked out there. And as I was preaching, I stopped and I said, what was in the cup? What is it that caused Christ to tremble? And I'll never forget this little eight-year-old girl raised her hand. And I said, yes. And she stood up, stood beside her desk. And she said, Mr. Washer, the wrath of God was in the cup. God's fierce hatred for all that is evil was in the cup. A wooden cross? All men are under the fierce, just wrath of God because of their vile wickedness. Someone had to drink down that wrath. Jesus Christ on that tree bore the guilt of His people and stood in their law place. Then all the holy, just hatred, wrath, Judgment and justice of God like blinding white light came crushing down on the head of His only begotten Son. Have you never read? And it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, to crush Him. To grind Him to powder. Imagine for a moment a dam 10,000 miles high and 10,000 miles wide and you're standing below the thing a mile back from the wall. And all of a sudden, in a second, the wall is pulled away and all that water comes crushing down upon you. But right before it gets to your feet, the ground opens up and swallows it down. So the wrath of God destined for people, the Son of God took that cup out of His Father's hand and He drank every drop. And when He cried out, it is finished, He turned it over and not one drop fell out. He drank it all. If I were to summarize the cup of wrath in the Old Testament, it would be something like this. God saying, because of the wickedness and the rebellion of the nations, I will send them the full force of My wrath. I will hand them My cup and I will make them drink it and they will drink it and they will stagger and they will die. But on that tree, Christ drank the cup. 
You've heard the story of Abraham and his son. Go up to that mountain and slaughter your only son. Abraham goes to that mountain in obedience. He ties his son down. His son offers no resistance, it seems. The old man goes for the knife, lays his hand upon the brow of his son, and as the hand comes down, he is stopped. God will provide. You say, oh, what a wonderful story. There it was, the, the animal there trapped by its horns in the bush. What, the, what a wonderful ending to the story. It wasn't the ending. It was the intermission. Hundreds of years later on a hill called Calvary, God the Father laid His hand on the head of His only begotten Son and He slaughtered Him. Someone had to die. You see, this is the cross that all these modern day preachers put in the back of the store and not in the storefront window because it's a shameful thing. It's a horrid thing. It's a terrible thing. Some of you are looking at each other as though I've never heard anything like this before. Absolutely. And that's why the cross has so little power in your life. This is a horrid thing. A vile thing. Not the kind of thing you wear around your neck. Someone had to die. Justice had to be satisfied. To demonstrate love, God had to put away sin first. And there was only one way to do it. The death of the only begotten Son of God. He died. And you see, this is what the Christian life is all about. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, he pleads with the people, he says, I urge you, as a pastor would urge a loving flock, he says, I urge you to do what? To lay down your life, to offer your life as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. But Paul gives the motivation. He says to lay down your life because of, based upon the mercies of God. And what is he talking about? The thing that ought to motivate you to lay down your life for Christ are the mercies of God. But in Romans chapter 12, the mercies of God are referring to the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. Where in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, Paul explains everything God has done for us in Christ. And he's saying, since God has done all this in Christ, now lay down your life for Him. And the more you know of this cross, the more you are given to lay down your life for Him. He's no longer this little accessory that you put on your life to make it better. He is your life. You are consumed by Him. You are constrained by Him. Every thought, every judgment, every word, everything you do. Why do you do this, sir? Why do you do that, sir? Because Christ has shed His own blood for my soul. The love of God in Christ constrains me. He died. Offer up the sacrifice. Creation sends forth the call. Offer up the sacrifice. One life to pay for them all. Offer up the sacrifice. The innocent one must be slain. Offer up the sacrifice and bring man back to God again. He died. It's amazing what the Spirit can do when He's here. It's amazing what is not done when He's not. But Christ died. Those words should be enough to break your heart into a thousand pieces and to cast you to the floor in worship. Christ died for you. But Paul tells us, Scripture tells us, that He did not remain dead. It is not just the death of Jesus Christ that saves us. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ also that has a great part in this story. If He had remained dead, there would be nothing. There would be no hope. All things would be dashed to pieces. But God has vindicated His only begotten Son by raising Him from the dead. And in raising Him from the dead, God has set His seal and told us, declared publicly through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that His sacrifice was sufficient to atone for the sins of His people.
Christ died, Christ rose again from the dead, and Christ ascended 40 days later to the right hand of His Father. I count myself among the old men who look for Christ in every line of the Old Testament. If Christ be removed from the Old Testament, if everything there is not a picture of Him, then I am left with nothing but moral stories. The animal slain to cover the nakedness of our first parents, that was Christ. The ark that weathered the deluge, that was Christ. The ram caught in the thicket by its horns, that was Christ. The temple and its sacrifices, that was Christ. He is the seed of Abraham and one greater than Moses and Joshua. When I read of Samson ripping up the gates of that city and throwing them down, I see Christ ripping up the gates of hell and throwing them down like they were the tiniest feather on the smallest fowl. Let me tell you something. I know Paul Washer. And I need more than proverbs and maxims and moral stories. I need a mighty God who can wrestle this man to the ground and save him. Jesus has really risen and he has appeared to us. We have seen Him with our own eyes. Now what do we learn about that? If you are going to be a missionary or a preacher, you cannot rely on the second-hand testimony of others. You cannot rely on the testimony of Calvin alone, or Piper alone, or even something you parrot from Scripture. You yourself must experience the resurrected Christ. You must be born again to testify of the new birth. You say, why do you say that to pastors? Because so many are not born again. You must be broken to testify of repentance. You must believe to testify of faith. You must know something of the filling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you're going to give testimony to the power of the Spirit. And you must know Him to testify of Him. We are not going to spread the gospel into this whole world through the cleverness of our minds, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what you think about the words. Let me ask you, are you clothed with power from on high? Sometimes the only thing that will ever keep you going is that He has risen. He has risen indeed. He has risen indeed. Your sins are gone. He has risen indeed. The world has a Savior. He has risen indeed. The universe has a King. He has risen. And one day, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, you will too. And I can't wait to see your beauty on that day. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. You must know it for yourself. You cannot depend upon the testimony of your godly grandmother or your mother or even men around you that you greatly esteem. You must know it for yourself. My goodness, some of us should just leave and get alone with God. The missionary, the preacher, must be entirely convinced of the grace of God. Because every day when you get up and you look in that mirror, you know you are called to proclaim a message that you yourself cannot even live up to. You need grace, you need grace, you need grace. But someone says, if you throw that much grace around, it'll be a license for sin. Only among the unconverted church members. Oh, they will take it as an excuse for sin. And the ungodly pastors will take it as an excuse for sin. But I want you to know this. The genuinely converted will say this. If grace be such, if it be so large and so wide, depths I cannot sound, then oh, let me be holy. Oh, let me serve Him. You see, that's the difference between the unregenerate and the regenerated heart. When light shines out of darkness and we understand that we've been justified by faith and the great weight of sin rolls off our shoulders and we cry out, Abba, Father, do you know that? It 
comes from countless hours alone with God in the Word of God. Not simply to gain knowledge so that you become a better debater, or not simply to prepare sermons, but you're alone with God in the Word of God because you want to know God. It comes from countless hours alone with God in the night watch when men with better sense are tucked in their beds. Of being shut up to God. I learned that language from old men. Of being shut up to God. Of being consumed by God in communion with God where no one can save you from Him. It comes from empowerings and fillings of the Holy Spirit. I will not give that up though you call me charismatic. Empowerings and fillings of the Holy Spirit as He replaces the virtue that has gone out of you in ministry and proves once again that it was to our benefit that Christ leave us and go to the right hand of the Father so that He might send the ever-present, all-powerful Comforter. It comes from countless trials and a peace that has absolutely nothing to do with the natural. A peace from God. A peace that passes all understanding. It comes from countless victories over sin. Yes, believers ought to have victory over sin. It comes from great victories over sin and the joy of making progress in the Christian faith and of bearing fruit that endures. But it also comes from countless failures and terrifying revelations of self and bone-crushing discipline and bending and breaking and repentance and restoration. A man of God, when he reaches old age, ought to be broken into a thousand pieces. Give us missionaries. Give us missionaries. No. Give us men who have been ravished and mauled by God and will have missionaries. You can have a high view of Jesus Christ only to the degree you have a high view of His gospel. And if you preach this truncated gospel for spiritual law thing that's going around, I can assure you that it's because you have a truncated Christ. And if in the book of Revelation we are warned that if you alter, add to, or take away from this prophecy, you will be brought under a curse, how much more, sir, will you be brought under judgment for not giving men the gospel that is the gospel of Christ? Without being truncated, without being edited, without being adorned in order to make it palatable to your carnal generation. Oh, how we should fear in preaching the gospel. Maybe you've never heard this before. Proclaim Christ as the only expected person. Do you realize how important this is? Christ made it clear. He said, I'm the fulfillment of everything. Now I want to read something to you from Lorraine Botner. Listen to this. And this is true. In all the history of the world, Jesus emerges as the only expected person. No one was looking for such a person as Julius Caesar or Napoleon or Washington or Lincoln to appear at the time and place that they did appear. No other person has had his, has had his course foretold or his work laid out for him centuries before he was born. But the coming of the Messiah has been predicted for centuries. We can use that and we ought to use it more in our preaching. He's the only expected person. There is no one else like Him. But He's not only the only expected person, He's the context of everything. Listen to this from the Expositor's Greek New Testament. The gist of prophecy in the Old Testament, the gist of it is the suffering and the resurrection of Christ and the preaching in the name of the risen one to all nations of repentance unto remission of sins. Now missionary, you want to be encouraged? Then understand this. Not only the appearance of Christ was predicted, not only His death and resurrection was predicted, but also the scriptures of the Old Testament predict the, the missionary endeavors of the church and its success. Yes, I said success. So many people use this idea of election just because they don't want to go out and witness to anybody and they're convinced they're the only group that God's going to save. 
No, God always is successful. He's going to call forth a mighty tribe of people. Look what it says in Psalms 22, after explaining in great detail the suffering of the Messiah, in verse 27 it says this, All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will worship before you. When you go on that mission field, I don't care how dark it is. I don't care how wicked it is. You stay there long enough. You preach true enough. And somebody's coming out of there saved. It's going to happen. Missionaries, some of you, friends of mine, on the day you're slaughtered in the foreign field, and your blood comes out, I want you to bleed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bleed it. With all that is in me, I promise that we will take care of your wife and your children. Don't worry about them. But bleed the gospel! Your blood is not as precious, nor is mine, as the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will not be satisfied laying on your bed because there's been some measure of blessing on your ministry. You will not be satisfied until the flag of Christ flies on every hill of this world. You will go to bed and you will rise up in the morning with the Moravian cry, Oh, that the Lamb might receive the full reward of His suffering. It's so much bigger than all of us. It's so much bigger than all of us. Oh, that all of us would just be pulverized into dust. That our names would disappear. But that Christ would be glorified. The book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles, but the Acts of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit working through the Apostles. When Moses interceded for idolatrous Israel, stood in the gap, God was going to destroy them. Some lesser theologians would say that the entire destiny of the nation of Israel was being held in the hand of the man Moses. But they forget Moses was held in the hand of God and sustained by His grace. It's the preacher's not a spin doctor. And he's not a marketing executive. He is only a faithful messenger of what has already been said by God and he needs to say it just the way God said it whether anyone likes it or not. The old Brainerds and the old Edwards they would cry out for more and more of a manifestation of the Spirit of God in their life and their ministry. Do that! Do that. And you will do well. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you know all things. They are all before you like an open book. Who can hide their heart from your presence? from your eye. The deeds of the most clever men are exposed before you. Your omniscience knows no bounds. And if it were not for grace, I would be of all men most terrified. But there is grace. abounding and glorious, poured out upon the weakest of men and abounding to your glory. Father, I praise you and I worship you 
And I thank you for all that you are and all that you have done. And there is no one like you in the heavens or the earth or under the earth. You are king and there is no other. You are savior and you share that glory with no one. Father, this night, you know me and my great need of grace. Why am I here except that you call the weakest among men, the most ignoble among brothers? And that by your grace, oftentimes, the lesser teaches the greater. That is always my case. And I praise you. I worship you. Father, help us tonight. To the wind with eloquence. To hell with a brilliant intellect, Father. But that truth go forward, that men be changed. That the state of your church be more glorious. I pray for grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy for myself and for the hearers who are present here. Help us, O oh God, and we will be helped, and we will boast in that help. In Jesus' name, Amen. It is a great privilege for me to be here this evening, an astounding privilege to stand here before you and to speak about things such as revival, reformation, the working of God among His people and among men. But tonight, I'm going to share with you an indictment. An indictment. But it is an indictment of hope. As I was praying through what I should do in this series of meetings, I came to a great conclusion, a great burden that was laid upon my heart. We need revival. We need an awakening. But we cannot simply expect the Holy Spirit to come down and clean up all the mess we've made. We have clear direction from the Word of God with regard to what He has done through Christ. How He expects us to live. How He expects us to order His church. And it does little good for men to cry out for extra biblical manifestations when biblical principle is violated all around us. I want you to know this. There is little need for the devil and evil men to oppose a man praying for revival unless he is also laboring for reformation. We have been given truth and we cannot simply do what is right in our own eyes and then expect the Holy Spirit to come down and bless our labors. As we look into the Old Testament, we see that Moses is given very, very detailed explanation how to build the temple. Now, was that given for Moses' sake or for the church's sake? I think that what is being explained here is that God is specific in His will. And that we are not to presume that we can take the smallest detail and ignore it. Now. I know that I am a frail man, and I know that I am buffeted by many weaknesses, but I have an indictment 
And I can't call it my indictment because who am I to indict anyone? And I dare not call it God's indictment for how can I presume upon His name? But I will say this. As I look around at the church and compare her to Scripture, I see that there are certain things that must change. I am not Martin Luther, and this is, 90, this is not 95 declarations nailed to Wittenberg's door. But this is a burden on my heart, and I must share it. I must share it. Now let me say this. What I'm going to say will anger some of you. But let me warn you. It may be true that you will be able to accuse me of arrogance. It may be true that you do not like my delivery. I have many times been arrogant and I have many times delivered truth in a wrong way. But don't allow that to be an excuse for you. The question is, what I'm saying, is it true? Whether it's delivered through a faulty messenger or no. Others of you will be rejoicing in what you hear and you'll want to say Amen and maybe pump your arms. But don't do that. Because all of us bear a measure of guilt. And if you have attained to some spiritual state, then I would say what my brother has said. What do you have that you have not received? And if you have received it, why do you boast? Would it not be better to worship God in humility? If you're a younger minister, I do not want you to get caught up in these truths and take them back and storm your church without love. I would make one suggestion. See to it that your knees are bleeding before you begin any sort of reformation. And if you are an older minister serving the Lord for many, many years, I beg you not to be arrogant. An old foolish king can learn from the weakest of his servants. And also I beg you this, have the courage to change everything, even if it is the last day of your life. At least you can go into glory knowing that you attempted a reformation that was biblical. And I'll say this as a warning to the older men. And listen to me carefully. I know the, the admonition in 1 Timothy chapter 5 of the way I am to address you, and so I address you this way. But there is a great awakening going on in this country. And not only in this country, in Europe where I have, I have been, and in South America and many other places, I see young men going back to the rock from which we were cut. They are reading Spurgeon and Whitfield. They're still listening to Ravenhill and Martin Lloyd-Jones and Tozer and Wesley. And it's a great, incredible movement just because popular media and Christianity today hasn't discovered what's going on. I want you to know that I would have never dreamed 15 years ago that I would see the awakening I'm seeing. Not through my ministry. But as I go to different places and see what God is doing without any of our ministries. Whether it's Holland, a thousand young men declaring things have to change. Crying out all night in prayer for the power of God and the truth of Scripture. Or South America. Recognizing that they've been so influenced by psychology and all sorts of superficial techniques coming from America with regard to evangelism and now weeping and broken are going back and evangelizing their churches. Or the inner city of the United States where I have sat up at times till 2 and 3 in the morning discussing theology with young African Americans in the hood whom God is going to raise up to do more preaching than anyone will ever be able to imagine on this day. There is an awakening. And I'm going to say this with tenderness. Most men over 40 don't even have a clue about it.
Many of the young people who are turning back to the old men and the old ways and the truths that have brought awakening time and time again in this world. Most of these young men are quite young. And they'll go to their pastors, they'll go to their leaders and say, look at this, we, what we've discovered. Look what happened in Wales. Look what happened in Africa. Look at this and look at that and look at this teaching. It's absolutely amazing. And most of them will either turn it away or say, it's nothing any different than what I've been preaching for 25 years, when in fact it is completely different than what they have been preaching in 25 years. And so we need to be very, very careful to understand that God is doing work. And He who began a good work will finish it. Many people have the idea that they're going to pray in a revival. And other people say, revival will come whether you pray or not. I'm not in either one of those camps. But I know this, when I see men and women and young people all over the world praying for an awakening, to me, that is the first fruits of revival. And I can count on the fact that He who gave those first fruits will bring in the full harvest. Now, I want to look at ten indictments, if we have time. Things that I believe that we must change. First of all, the first indictment, a practical denial of the sufficiency of Scripture, especially in my denomination. A practical denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.15 and on says, And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Over the last several decades, there has been a mighty battle with regard to the inspiration of Scripture. Now, some of you have not been a part of that battle, but many of us in more liberal denominations most certainly have. A battle for the Bible! But there's only one problem. When you come to believe as a people that the Bible is inspired... You've only fought half the battle. Because the question is not merely, is the Bible inspired? Is it inerrant? The major question following that that must be answered, is the Bible sufficient? Or do we have to bring in every so-called social science and cultural study in order to know how to run a church? That is a major question. Social sciences, in my opinion, have taken precedent over the Word of God in such a way that most of us can't even see it. It has so crept into our church, our evangelism, and our missiology that you can barely call what we're doing Christian anymore. Psychology, anthropology, sociology have become primary, in, primary influences in the church. Several years ago, many years ago, when I was in seminary, I remember a professor walked in and he started drawing footprints on the blackboard. And as he marched them across the blackboard, then he turned to all of us and said only this, Aristotle is walking through the halls of this institution. Beware. For I hear his footsteps more clearly than those of the Apostle Paul and the team of inspired men who were with him and even the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We have come to believe that a man of God can deal in certain tiny areas in the life of the church, but when it really gets tough, we need to go to the social experts. That's an absolute lie. It says here in Scripture that the man of God may be equipped, adequate, equipped for every good work. What does Jerusalem have to do with Rome? And what do we have to do with all these modern day social sciences? 
that were actually created as a protest against the Word of God. And why is it that evangelism and missions and so-called church growth is more shaped by the anthropologist, the sociologist, and the Wall Street student who is up on every cultural trend. All the activity in our church must be based upon the Word of God. All the activity in missions upon the Word of God. Our missionary activity, our church activity, everything we do ought to flow from the theologian and the exegete. The man who opens up his Bible and only has one question. What is thy will, O God? We are not to send out questionnaires to carnal people to discover what kind of church they would attend. A church ought to be seeker friendly, but the church ought to recognize there's only one seeker. His name is God. And if you want to be friendly to someone, if you want to accommodate someone, accommodate Him and His glory. Whether it is rejected by everyone else, we are not called to build empires. We are not called to be accepted. We are called to glorify God. And if you want, to the, the church, you want the church to be something other than a peculiar people, then you want something God does not want. I want you to listen to Isaiah, just for a moment, chapter 8. Listen to what he says. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. This is a perfect, a perfect definition or at least illustration of the social sciences and the church growth gurus and everything else. Because every two or three years, all their major theories change. Not only on what is a man or how you fix him, but what is a church and how you make it grow. Every two or three years, there is another fad coming down the line of what can make your church into something super in the eyes of the world. Just recently, one of the greatest or most well-known church growth experts said that he discovered that he was entirely wrong on all his theory. But instead of turning then to Scripture on his knees, broken and weeping, he goes out to find another theory. They give no clear word. It says here in Isaiah, Should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Should we as churchmen, as preachers, as pastors, as Christians, should we go out and consult the spiritually dead on behalf of those whom the Holy Spirit has made alive? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The second indictment. An ignorance of God. At times I am asked, Brother Paul, please come and do a week-long series on the attributes of God. And many times I will say this, I'm, I'm, well, brother, have you thought this through? He said, what do you mean have I thought this through? Well, it's quite controversial, the subject that you're putting, you're giving me to go teach in your church. And I say, what do you mean it's controversial? I mean, it's God. We're Christians. This is a church. What do you mean it's controversial? I said, dear pastor, you listen to me. When I begin instructing your people on the justice of God, the sovereignty of God, the wrath of God, the supremacy of God, the glory of God, you're going to have some of your finest and oldest church members stand up and say something like this. That's not my God. I could never love a God like that. Because they have a God they have made with their own mind and they love what they have made. Jeremiah, 
9, 23, 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. Psalms 50, You thought, God speaking, You thought I was just like you. I will reprove you. And state the case in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces, and there will be none who delivers. Now, what is the problem here? There is a lack of the knowledge of God. Many of you possibly think, oh, talking about the attributes of God and theology, it's all high ivory tower stuff that has no practical application. Listen to, you, listen to yourself speak. Saying the knowledge of God has no practical explanation. Do you know why all your Christian bookstores are filled up with self-help books and five ways to do that and six ways to be godly and ten ways not to fall? Because people don't know God. And so they have to be given all sorts of trivial little devices of the flesh to keep them walking as sheep ought to walk. 1 Corinthians 15.34 Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Why the rampant sinning, even among God's people, a lack of the knowledge of God? Of God! Now, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you attended a conference on the attributes of God? When was the last time as a pastor you taught for a solid year on who God is? How much of all the teaching that goes on in America every week has anything to do with who God is? And then we wonder, isn't it so easy to go with the flow to just follow everybody else. And then one day you hear something like this and all of a sudden you go, I, I can't even remember when anybody taught on the attributes of God. No wonder we are a people as we are. To know Him. That's what everything's about. That's eternal life. And eternal life doesn't begin when you pass through the gates of glory. Eternal life begins with conversion. Eternal life is to know Him. Do you honestly think you're going to be thrilled about swinging on gates of pearl and walking down streets of gold for an eternity? The reason why you won't lose your mind in eternity is because of this. There is one there who is infinite in glory. And you will spend an eternity of eternities tracking Him down. And you will never get your arms even around the foothill of His mountain. Start now! So many different things you want to know and do in all the books. Get out a book on God. This one. And study it. To know Him. To know Him. Sunday morning, because of all of this, I would submit to you that it would be better not even to have a Sunday morning. Sunday morning is the greatest hour of idolatry in the entire week of America. Because people are not worshipping the one true God the great mass at least, but are worshiping a God formed out of their own heart and by their own flesh, satanic devices and worldly intelligence. They've made a God just like themselves and He looks more like Santa Claus than He does Yahweh. There can be no fear of the Lord among us because there is no knowledge of the Lord among us. Third indictment. A failure to address man's malady. When I look at the book of Romans, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, it is not a systematic theology, but if you could say any book in the Bible was a systematic theology, the book of Romans would be the closest. 
Isn't it amazing that Paul spends the first three chapters of that book seeking to do one thing, bring all men into condemnation. Bring all men into condemnation. But it is not that condemnation is his great sunum bonum in his theology. It is not his end or his final purpose. It is a means to bring salvation to his readers. Because men must be brought to a knowledge of self before they surrender self over to God. Men are made in such a fallen manner now that you must cut away from them absolutely every hope in the flesh before they be brought to God. This is important in everything, but it's especially important in evangelism. I remember this was I was 21 years old and had just been called to preach. And I walked into an old store where they would sell suits to ministers for half price. They'd been doing it for 50, 60 years. And I walked in there and I was looking for a suit in Paducah, Kentucky. And all of a sudden, the door opened. I heard the bell ring and it closed. There was an old, old man standing there. I never caught his name, but when he walked in, he looked right at me and he said, Boy, you've been called to preach, haven't you? I said, Yes, sir. He was an old, old evangelist. He said, you see where that building is right outside this building? I said, yeah. He said, I used to preach there. The Spirit of God would come down and souls would be saved. I said, sir, please tell me about it. He says, there wasn't anything like this evangelism today. He said, we would preach for two and three weeks and give no invitation to sinful men. We would plow and plow and plow and plow the hearts of men until the Spirit of God began to work and break their hearts. I said, sir, how did you know when the Spirit of God was coming to break their hearts? And he said, well, let me just give you an example. He said, many decades ago, I walked into this store to buy a suit. Someone had handed me $30 and said, preacher, go buy you a suit tomorrow. And when I walked through the door, the young clerk taking care of the shop turned around and looked at me. And when he looked at me, fell down on the floor and cried out, Who can save a wicked man like me? And I knew that the Spirit of God had fallen upon the place. Now we just walk in and talk to them, give them three exploratory questions and ask them if they want to pray a prayer and ask Jesus to come into their heart. And we make a twofold son of hell who will never again be open to the gospel because of the religious lie that we as evangelicals have spewed out of our mouth. I'll say something that Leonard Ravenhill used to say. Now you understand why I preach in a lot of places once. But that is the truth. When we treat sin superficially, first of all, we are fighting against the Holy Spirit. And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin. There are very popular preachers today who are more concerned about giving you your best life now than they are eternity. And they brag about the fact that they do not mention sin in their preaching. I can tell you this, the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with their ministry lest He be working against it. That would be the only thing. Why? When a man says he has no ministry dealing with the sin of men, the Holy Spirit does. It is a primary ministry of the Holy Spirit to come and convict the world of sin. And so know this, when you do not deal specifically, passionately, lovingly with men and their depraved condition, the Holy Spirit is nowhere around you. Also, we are deceivers when we deal with the malady of men lightly. Like shepherds of Jeremiah's day, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. We are not only deceivers, but we are immoral. Like a doctor who denies his Hippocratic oath because he doesn't want to tell someone bad news because he thinks that person will be cross against them, will be angry with them, will be sad. And so he does not tell them the news most necessary to save their life. 
I hear preachers today, they say, no. No, 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 no. You don't understand, Brother Paul. We're not like the people of the day of John and Charles Wesley. We are not like the culture that Whitfield addressed or Edwards. We're, we're not as hardy as they are. We're broken. We don't have as much self-esteem. We're feeble. We can't bear such preaching. Listen to me. Have you ever studied the lives of these men? What they preach, their culture couldn't bear it either. No one has ever been able to bear the preaching of the Gospel. They will either turn against it with the fierceness of an animal or they will be converted. And to give you a thing about us being more feeble and not having the self-esteem, our country and this world is overrun with this disgusting malady of self-esteem. Our greatest problem is that we esteem self more than we esteem God. We are also thieves when we do not speak much about sin. We are thieves. Let me ask you a question. This afternoon, this morning, where did all the stars go? Did some cosmic giant come by in a basket and pick them all up and throw them in and carry them someplace else? Where did all the stars go this morning? They were there, but you couldn't see them. But then, the sky grew darker and darker and darker. And as that night turned black as pitch, the stars came out in the fullness of their glory. When you refuse to teach on the radical depravity of men, it is an impossibility that you bring glory to God, His Christ, and His cross. Because the cross of Jesus Christ and the glory thereof is most magnified when it's placed in front of the backdrop of our depravity. She loved much because she's been forgiven much. And she knew how much she had been forgiven because she knew how wicked she was. Oh, we're afraid to tell men of their wickedness and they can never love God because of it. We've robbed them the opportunity to boast not in self, but to follow the admonition, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. A fourth indictment, an ignorance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you tonight that this country is not gospel hardened. It is gospel ignorant because most of its preachers are. And let me repeat this. The malady in this country is not liberal politicians, the root of socialism, Hollywood, or anything else. It is the so-called evangelical pastor of our day and preacher of our day and evangelist of our day. That is where the malady is to be found. We know the gospel. We have taken the glorious gospel of our blessed God and reduced it down to four spiritual laws and five things God wants you to know with a little superstitious prayer at the end. And if someone repeats it after us with enough sincerity, we purposely declare them to be born again. We've traded regeneration for decisionism. First of all, I am amazed after I talk about what I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes here, how many godly believers of 30 and 40 years walking in the faith come up to me with tears saying, Brother Paul, I never heard this before in my life. And yet it is the historical doctrine of redemption, of propitiation. You see, when you talk about the Gospel, my dear friend, let's set it up just clearly. The Gospel begins with the nature of God. And it goes from there to the nature of man and the fallenness thereof. And it goes from there. Those two great columns of the Gospel come to set up for us what should be called and known as, in every believer's mouth, the great dilemma. And what is that dilemma? If God is just, He cannot forgive you. The greatest problem in all of Scripture is this. How can God be just and at the same time the justifier of wicked men? 
when Scripture throughout the Bible says, especially, I'll draw from one text in Proverbs, He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. And yet all our Christian songs boast about how God justifies the wicked. That is the greatest problem. That is the Acropolis of the Christian's faith. So said Martin Lloyd-Jones and Charles Spurgeon and anyone else who's read Romans 3. You see, God said this before people. The great problem is if God is truly just and all men are truly wicked, God to be just must be damn wicked man. But then God, for His own glory, for the great love with which He loved us, sent forth His Son, who walked on this earth as a perfect man. And then, according to the plan, the eternal plan of God, He went to that tree. And on that tree, He bore our sin. And He became, standing in the law place of His people, bearing our guilt, He became a curse. Cursed is every man who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law so as to perform them. Christ redeemed us from the curse, becoming a curse in our place. So many people have this romantic, powerless view of the gospel that the Christ is there hanging on the tree, suffering under the wounds of the Roman Empire, and the Father did not have the moral fortitude to bear the suffering of His Son, so He turned away. No! He turned away because His Son became sin. And so many, when He's in that garden and He cries out, let this cup pass from Me, people speculate, well, what was in the cup? Oh, it's the Roman cross, it's the whip, it's the nails, it's all this and all that. I do not want to take away from the physical sufferings of Christ on that. But the cup was the cup of God the Father's wrath that had to be poured out on the Son. Someone had to die bearing the guilt of God's people, forsaken of God by His justice, and crushed under the wrath of God, for it pleased the Lord to crush Him. I was in Germany a while back, or in a Germanic seminary in Europe a while back, and this book, The Cross of Christ, now it wasn't John Stott's book, it was another, I pulled it off and began to read it, and this is what it said. The Father looked down from heaven at the suffering inflicted upon His Son by the hands of men and counted that as payment for our sin. It's heresy. Now, that physical suffering, that nailing to the tree, that was all part of the wrath of God. It had to be a bloody sacrifice. I'll take nothing away from that. But my friend, if you stop there, you don't have a gospel. And let me ask you, when the gospel is preached today and when it is shared in personal evangelism today, do you ever hear the things I have just said? Almost never. It is never made clear that Christ was able to redeem because He was crushed under the justice of God. And having satisfied divine justice with His death, God is now just and the justifier of the wicked. Gospel reductionism. We wonder why it has no power. We wonder why... What happened? I'll tell you, when you leave the gospel behind and there is no longer any power in your supposed gospel message, then you've got to go to all the little tricks of the trade that are so prominently used today to convert men. And we all know most of them, all of them, do not work. My dear friend, let me say this. Several years ago, graduating from seminary, I had to make a decision whether I was going to go for my PhD. God, in order to save my spiritual life, sent me to the middle of the jungles in Peru, as far away from the academic world as I could get. And there, I began to realize something. As Spurgeon said, greater men with greater minds than I have approached this doctrine of the second coming, but to no avail. It is a great and mighty doctrine. He said, I will set myself to this. 
seeking to comprehend something of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let me tell you this. This is what it, it makes me so angry. When men treat the glorious gospel of Christ as though it was a first step into Christianity that only takes about ten minutes of counseling and after that you go on to greater stuff. That shows you how pathetic we are in our knowledge of the things of God. My friend, on the day of the second coming, you will understand absolutely everything about the second coming. But you will be an eternity of eternities in heaven and you will not even begin to comprehend the glory of God in Calvary. It's what everything is about. Young man, young preacher, listen to me. Go after Him on that tree. What it means. You'll need nothing to build strange fires in your oven if you only catch a glimpse of what He did on that tree. What He did on that tree. I love to say this. I've said it a million times. Abraham takes Isaac up that mountain. His son, his only son, whom he loved. Do you suppose the Holy Spirit was trying to tell us about something future? And that son put up no struggle but laid down. And when that father gave his will in to the will of God, he brought that flint knife to pierce his own son's heart. But his hand was stayed and it was told the old man that God had provided a ram. So many Christians think, oh, what a beautiful end to that story. It's not the end. It's the intermission. Thousands of years later, God the Father laid His hand upon the brow of His Son, His only Son, whom He loved, and took the flint knife out of the hand of Abraham and slaughtered His only begotten Son under the full force of wrath. Now do you know why that little gospel you preach has no power? Because it is no gospel. Get to the gospel! Spend your life on your knees! Get away from men! Study the cross! Fourth indictment. An ignorance of the doctrine of regeneration. An ignorance of the doctrine of regeneration. My dear friend, and I'm going to say this bluntly, I know that there are Calvinists here, and I know that there are Arminians here, and I know that there are all sorts of strange animals in between. But I want you to know this. Although I am leaning more toward, I, I guess I call myself a five-point Spurgeonist, I want you to know this. Calvinism is not the issue. No, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble when this goes on the internet. <laughs> Calvinism is not the issue. I'll tell you what the issue is. Regeneration. And that is why I can have fellowship with Wesley and Ravenhill and Tozer and all the rest. Because regardless of where they stood on the other issue, they believed that salvation could not be manipulated by the preacher. That it was a magnificent work of the power of Almighty God. And with them, therefore, I stand. That it was a work of God. There is a greater manifestation of the power of God in the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit than in the creation of the world, of the universe, because He created the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, but He recreates a man out of a corrupt mass. It is paralleled with the very resurrection of our Savior from the dead. If you are a preacher, I understand that in preaching there is teachers and preachers and expositors and this and that and all of them are very necessary for the health of the church. But uh, you must understand this. 
As old G. Campbell Morgan, I've heard of him that when he would go up that majestic tower to preach, he would quote to himself, as a lamb led to the slaughter, as a sheep for his shears. He knew that apart from a magnificent manifestation of the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, everything He said would be death. But it is the Spirit that gives life. And in that sense, every one of us who proclaim must proclaim as a prophet. What do I mean by that? We are always, we are always Ezekiel standing in that valley of dry bones and they are very dry. And we walk out there and what do we do? We prophesy. We say, hear the word of the Lord. We know that the wind of God must blow on these slain or they will not rise again. And when you have fully grasped that in the innermost part of your being, you will no longer give yourself to the manipulation that is so often carried out in the name of evangelism in this country. You will proclaim the Word of God. You will proclaim it. The doctrine of regeneration. Look at the Wesleys. Look what they had to face for a moment. And, my dear Whitfield, what was it? Everybody believed they were Christian. Thoroughly Christian. Why? Well, they were baptized as infants. Brought into the covenant. They were confirmed. They lived like devils. Regeneration was traded for a type of creedalism that was given authority by the religious leaders of the day. And then here comes the Wesleys. No, it is not right with your soul. You are not born again. There is no evidence of spiritual life. Examine yourself. Test yourself if you are in the faith. Make your calling and election sure. Ye must be born again here in America because of the last several years, several decades of evangelism. The idea of born again is totally lost. It only means that at one time in a crusade, you made a decision and you think you were sincere. But there's no evidence of a supernatural recreating work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If any man, not if some men, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And now, it's the same today. What do we face? I'll tell you what we face. It's not a sort of infant baptism necessarily most of the time. It's not a high church confirmation by an ecclesi ecclesiastical authority. What we face is the sinner's prayer. And I'm here to tell you, if there's anything I've declared war on, it's that. You say, Brother Paul, yes, in the same way that infant baptism, my opinion, was the, was the golden calf of the Reformation, for the Baptists and the Evangelicals and everyone else who's followed them today, I'll tell you, that sinner's prayer has sent more people to hell than anything on the face of the earth. You say, how can you say such a thing? Go with me to Scripture and show me, please. I, I would love you to stand up and tell me where anyone evangelized that way. The Scripture does not say that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel and said that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, who would like to ask me into their heart? I see that hand. It's not what it says. He said, repent and believe the gospel. Now men today are trusting in the fact that at least one time in their life they prayed a prayer and someone told them they were saved because they were sincere enough. And so in their salvation, if you ask them, are you saved? They do not say, yes I am because I'm looking unto Jesus and there is mighty evidence giving me assurance of being born again. No, they say, one time in my life I prayed a prayer. And they live like devils. But they prayed a prayer. And 
And some of them... I heard of one evangelist who was coaxing a man to do that thing. Finally, the man felt so uncomfortable, the evangelist said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll pray to God for you. And if it's what you want to say to God, squeeze my hand. Behold the power of God! Decisionism. The idolatry of decisionism. Men think they're going to heaven because they have judged the sincerity of their own decision. When Paul came to the church in Corinth, he did not say to them, look, you're not living like Christians, so let's go back to that one moment in your life and when you prayed that prayer and let's see if you were sincere. No, he said this, test yourselves, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Because I want you to know, my friend, salvation is by faith alone. It is a work of God. It is a grace upon grace upon grace. But the evidence of conversion is not just your examination of your sincerity at the moment of your conversion. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. It is the ongoing fruit in your life. Oh, my dear friend, look what we've done. Is it a tree known by its fruit? What, 60, 70% of America thinks it's converted, born again? We kill how many thousands of babies a day? We're hated around the world for our immorality? Yet we're Christian? And I lay this squarely, the blame, at the feet of the preacher. Fifth indictment, an unbiblical gospel invitation. We've touched on it a bit. I want to go further. Look how we do it today. I mean, now, now listen to me. The more I've seen this everywhere. The Calvinist, the Arminian, a lot of them share something in common. It is this, the same superficial invitation. They talk a lot of talk about a lot of things, and then they come to the invitation, and it's almost as though everyone loses their mind. Walk up to someone and says, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Can you imagine telling that to an American? Sir, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. What? God loves me? Oh, well, that's great because I love me too! Oh, this is wonderful! And God's got a, a wonderful plan. i got a wonderful plan for my life too. And if I accept Him into my life, I'll have my best life now. This is absolutely wonderful. That is not biblical evangelism. Let me give you something in its place. God comes to Moses and He says this, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The reaction of Moses. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. Evangelism begins with the nature of God. Who is God? God. Can a man recognize anything about his sin if he hath not a standard with which to compare himself? If we tell him nothing but trivial things about God that tickle the carnal mind, will he ever be brought to genuine repentance and faith? We do not begin with God loves you and has a wonderful plan. We begin with a discourse of the full counsel of who God is. And we tell him from the start, it may cost him his life. After that, we have exploratory questions. Hey, you know you're a sinner, don't you? That's like a few years ago, my mother died of cancer. It's like the doctor walking in on the day and say, Hey Barb, you know you got cancer, don't you? We treat it so superficially. No weight. Nothing solemn. Sir, there is a terrible malady upon you. And a judgment coming. Because if you just tell man, Sir, you know you're a sinner? 
Go ask the devil if he knows he's a sinner. He'll say, well, yes, I am. Mighty good one at that. Or mighty bad one, depending on how you look at it. But yes, I know I'm a sinner. The question is not, do you know you are a sinner? The question is, is the Holy Spirit so at work in your heart through the preaching of the Gospel that a change has been wrought so that the sin you once loved you now hate? And the sin you once desired to embrace, you're wanting to run from it as though you were running from a dragon. And then the question, do you want to go to heaven? This is the reason I would not let my children go to 98% of the Sunday schools and vacations Bible schools in evangelical churches. Because some well-meaning person stands up and says, isn't Jesus wonderful after showing the Jesus film? Yes. How many of you little children love Jesus? Oh, I do. Who wants to accept Jesus into their little heart? Oh, I do. And they get baptized. And they may walk a little bit because they've been, they've been raised in a Christian culture, sort of. A church culture, anyways. And then when they turn 15, 16, when they have the strength of will, they begin to break the bonds. Begin to live in wickedness. And then we go after them saying, You're Christian! You're just not living like it! Stop your backsliding! Instead of going to them biblically and saying this, You made a confession of faith in Christ. You professed Him even in baptism. But now it seems as though you have turned away from Him. Examine yourself. Test yourself. There's little evidence of any true conversion in you. And then when they're 24, 25 after college, maybe 30, they come back to church and they rededicate their life and they join right in with that pseudo-Christian morality that encompasses churchianity in America. And in the end, they hear this, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity! I never knew you! He said, Brother Paul, you're so angry. Have I not a right to be? Somebody must be! crying out for revival, but we haven't even got the foundation straight. Oh, that revival would come and straighten our foundations. But would we, while we have open eyes and open ears and have Scripture in front of us, should we not correct these things? Would you like to go to heaven? My dear friend, everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. The question is not, do you want to go to heaven? The question is this, do you want God? Have you stopped being a hater of God? Has Christ become precious to you? Do you desire Him? That's what political theory is all about, my dear friend. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But men are haters of God. So the question is not, do you want to go to a special place where you'll no longer hurt and you'll get everything you want? The question is, do you want Him? Has Christ become precious to you? Often if a person prays, they're told after that, would you like to go to heaven? Well, yes. Well, then, would you like to pray and ask Jesus into your heart? Now, my dear friend, let me say this. There are people who get saved using that methodology, but it's not because of it, it's in spite of it. Yeah. Sir, do you desire Christ? Do you see your sin? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Sir, let's look at a few Scriptures here that lay out for us what repentance looks like. Is the Spirit bearing witness that this is happening in your life? Do you see brokenness? Do you, do you, do you see that the, the disintegration of everything you thought and now your mind is filled with new thoughts about God and new desires and new hopes? Yes, I see that, sir. That may be the first fruits of repentance. Now, throw yourself upon Christ. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. And then, listen to me. You have the authority to tell men the Gospel. You have authority to tell men how to be saved. And you have authority to teach men biblical principles of assurance. But you have no authority to tell men they are saved. That is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. But when you take them through that little thing, did you ask Jesus into your heart? Yes. Do you think you were sincere? Yes. Do you think He saved you? I don't know. Of course He saved you because you were sincere and He promised that if you asked Him to come in, He'd come in so you're saved. 
saved. And they walk out of the church after five minutes of counseling and the evangelist goes to Denny's to eat and the man is lost. The man is lost. An unbiblical invitation. If they ever doubt, if they ever doubt their salvation, again, here we go again. If they ever doubt their salvation, well, let's go back to a point in time. Was there ever a point in time in your life you prayed and asked Jesus to come in? Yes. Were you sincere? I think so. It's the devil bothering you. And if they live without growth, even in the context of a church, without growth, in continued carnality. No fear. We blame it on the lack of personal discipleship. And we write it off as the doctrine of the carnal Christian. The doctrine of the carnal Christian has destroyed more lives and sent more people to hell. Do Christians struggle with sin? Yes. Can a Christian fall into sin? Absolutely. Can a Christian live a continuous in a continuous state of carnality all the days of his life, not bearing fruit and truly be Christian? Absolutely not. Or every promise in the Old Testament regarding the New Testament covenant has failed, and everything God said about discipline in Hebrews is a lie. A tree is known by its fruit. When we work with men in conversion, I have seen preachers who understood much about the things of God, but when they come down even after an exemplary gospel presentation, they will enter once again into this methodology. Let me give you a story and then we'll go on to the next indictment, but a story that is one of the most precious moments in my life as a Christian. I was preaching in Canada just just actually they told me it's like 30 kilometers from Alaska. There were more grizzly bears in the town than there were people, really. It was a little church of about 15, 20 people and I was preaching. And right when I got up in the pulpit, this mountain of a man walked in. In his 60s, early 70s, but just a mountain of a man. He could have whipped every one of us in this building. And as I preached, as I saw his face, I just threw everything away and started preaching the gospel. He was the saddest human being I've ever seen. Just gospel, gospel. And when I got done, I walked right from the pulpit to him. I said, sir, what's wrong? What's troubling your soul? I've never seen a man so sad and downhearted in all my life. And he pulled out a manila envelope and it had some x-rays which I couldn't understand. But he said this, I just came from the doctor. I'm going to die in three weeks. That's what he told me. Now I have lived all my life on a working cattle ranch. You can only get there by float plane or riding horses across the mountains and all this stuff. He said, I've never been to church. I've never read a Bible. I believe there's a God. And one time I heard somebody talking about some guy named Jesus. He said, I've never been afraid of anything in my life and I am terrified. I said, sir, did you understand the message, the gospel? He said, yes. Now what would have a great majority of preachers done at that moment? Or would you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart? That's what they would have done. I said, sir, you understood it? He said, I understood it, but is that it? Is that just... He said, a child could have understood that. In anybody. Is, is that all it is that I understand it and I pray? Or I said, sir, you're going to die in three weeks. I have to leave tomorrow. I will cancel my plane ticket and we will stay here over the Scriptures wrestling and crying out to God until you are either converted or you die and go to hell. And so we began. I began in the Old Testament, New Testament, every verse of Scripture dealing with the promises of God regarding redemption and salvation over and over, time after time, reading John 3.16, praying for a while, crying out to God, questioning the man regarding repentance, regarding faith, regarding assurance, working till Christ be formed in him. And then finally, just exhausted that evening, there was no breakthrough. There was nothing. And I said, Sir, let's pray. We prayed. I said, Sir, read John 3.16 again. He said, well, We've read this a million times. I said, I know, but it's one of the greatest promises of salvation. Read that text again. 
And I'll never forget, he had my Bible on his lap and those big mountainous hands of his. And he said, okay. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave... Oh, I'm saved. I'm saved. Brother Paul, all my sins are gone. I have eternal... I'm saved. I mean, I said, how do you know? He said, haven't you ever read this verse before? What was going on? A working of the Spirit of God instead of those little tricks you try. What you want to go eat. What you think preaching is the spectacle and after that you go back to the hotel. No, after the preaching is when the work begins. Dealing with souls. People come forward in meetings. They're counseled by someone who shouldn't be counseling. Five minutes. They're given the could give the card to the pastor, and the pastor says, "I would like to present to you the new a new child of God. Welcome him into the family of God." How dare you? If you are going to present him, say this: This man tonight has made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And because of our fear of God and our love for the souls of men, we will now be working with Him to make sure that Christ has truly been formed in Him, that He truly has a biblical understanding of repentance and faith and great assurance and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to do. Look what we've done. I plead with you. Look what we're doing. And, and this is not some cult. This is us. Stop it. Stop it. Sixth indictment. Ignorance regarding the nature of the church. God has only one religious institution. It's the church. It's a church. And our ultimate goal and the ultimate product of revival will be the planting of biblical churches. I have the greatest fear that the local church today is despised. Tell somebody you're an itinerant preacher, that you have a worldwide ministry and they all bow down. Tell someone you're a pastor of a group of 30 and they make you sit in the back during the conference. He's not the prince of itinerant preachers. He's the prince of pastors. Several years ago, Bill Clinton had a slogan during the election. It's the economy, stupid. My pastor, Jeff Noblet, one of the elders in our church, the primary teaching, preaching pastor, he said to me one day, he goes, you know, I'd like to have a bunch of shirts made up. What would they say, Brother Jeff? It's the church, stupid. Jesus gave His life for the church. A beautiful, virgin, pristine church. And if you want to give your life for something in the ministry, give it to the church. To a church. A body of believers. A local congregation. It's the church. Now let me say this about the church. I want you to listen well. The, there is not a remnant of believers in the church. We all know about the remnant theology. You know, throughout all the course of Israel, there was Israel, the people of God, and a remnant of true believers. That's not true about the church. There is not a remnant of believers or a small group of believers inside a larger group called the church. The church is the remnant. I want to say this. If pastors have ever come close to blaspheming, it is with regard to this. I hear theologians, itinerant teachers, pastors, this and that, saying these sorts of things. There's just as much sin in the church as out of the church. There's just as much divorce in the church as out of the church. There's just as much immorality and pornography in the church as out of the church. And then preachers saying, yes, the church is acting like a whore. I want you to know this. You ought to be very careful calling the bride of Jesus Christ a whore. I'll tell you what the problem is. Pastors and preachers don't know what the church is. I want you to know that the church of Jesus Christ in America is beautiful. She is frail at times. She is weak. She is buffeted. 
She is not perfect, but I want you to know she is broken. She is humbly, and she she is humbly walking with her God. The problem is you are you don't know what the church is. Today, because of the lack of biblical preaching, the so-called church is filled up with carnal, wicked people identified with Christianity. And then because of all the goats in the midst of the lambs, the lambs are blamed for all the things the goats are doing. And then the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of us. Have you ever read... Let's just, I know we're running out of time, but just go quickly with me. Just go quickly. I want to show you something. Go to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, thank you. Verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, I do not want to take away anything from the people called Israel, but this text is also applied to the church. Understand that. Don't want to get any battles on eschatology, but in the Bible, in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, it's applied to the people of God. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I hear preachers saying all the time, but well, when you look back and you see Israel, you see a bunch of godless, idolatrous people, and in the midst of them there was a tiny remnant of true believers. That is true, but don't apply that to the New Testament church. Because he says... He says, I am going to do something different. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them. He hasn't just given you, if you're converted, He hasn't just given you a stone tablet of laws. He has supernaturally, through the doctrine of regeneration, written those laws in your heart. And because He has done that, I will be their God and they shall be My people. And look what it says. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know Me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. But I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. Again, the doctrine of regeneration. God is doing a new work these last 2,000 years. We don't have a lot of churches in America. We have a lot of really nice brick buildings on finely manicured lawns. Just because someone says they're of the church or they're Christian, does it make it so? Look what he says. They'll not even have to teach one another. That doesn't mean there won't be teachers and preachers. But there will all be an outstanding knowledge of God among them, particularly with regard to their sins having been forgiven. Quickly, just jump, look at 32, chapter 32, verse 38. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. He doesn't say, I hope so, maybe, if I get lucky, oh, if I can get enough evangelists to work with me, maybe this will all come out right. He says, I am going to pull a people for me. A people that I'm going to give to my Son. And He says, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Look at this, and I will give them one heart and one way. Huh? Now don't be angry with me. Any angrier than you already are at least. But listen to me. The 70s and 80s and all the Jesus marches and everyone weeping and crying. The church is so divided. The church is not one. My dear friend, let me tell you something. If the church is not one, there is a prayer out there that God the Father did not answer for His Son. And this new covenant promise has failed. So I want to redirect you a little bit. I want to submit to you, the church is one. She's always been one. Have you ever sat down on an airplane or maybe met someone in a marketplace you didn't even know? And you being maybe Baptist or Mennonite or this or that, but truly evangelical, truly Christian, you talk to them for no more than a few minutes and you discover, BAM! It's a believer! 
says a live one. And at that moment, you'd give your life for them. You'd give your life for them. I remember one time we were in Departamento Amazonas in Peru, and it was during the time of the Sendero Luminoso and the civil war that was going on there. We rode 22 hours up in the back of a grain truck under a black tarp, and at about midnight, we pulled the tarp off, the truck stopped, and we jumped off into the jungle. We stayed the night just at the edge of the jungle and made our ways up to a place called Ingenio in Tambolic. About halfway up, we got lost in the dark the next day. So we were praying, me and my dear friend Paco, we were praying, Oh God, give us some direction. We're lost. We don't, if, if we're found in here, the terrorists own the place, the military wouldn't even go in. And we cried out, Oh God, give us some direction. Help us. We heard a bell. Then we heard somebody talking. It was a strange conversation at first, we thought. But then we realized it was a little boy coming in from the fields with his burro, and he was talking to his burro. And so we got behind him and we followed him. And then we stood on the edge of the town, little village, huts, dobe homes. And I said, Paco, I said, you know, if, if the terrorists own this thing, we're dead. Yeah, but we got to go somewhere. So we got down, walked up to a man who was drunk in the dark, and said, Hay hermanos por aquí. Are there brothers here? Because everybody knows what that means in the mountains. It means a real Christian. And he said, La vieja por ahí. The old woman. Over there. And so I went over there. There's an old Nazarene woman. And I knocked on the door. I said, I am an evangelical pastor. Please help me. And that old woman reached out with that lantern. She grabbed me. She pulled me inside. She grabbed Paco, took us down. Her house was cut out of a kind of a cliff in the mud and took us down in the basement where there was some hay and chickens and things. And she sat us there and she lit a lamp. And then a little boy came in and she called to him and said, Go get the other brothers. And they started bringing chickens and yucca and everything else, risking their life. Why? Because we are one. Stop saying all these silly things that you're saying. That the body of Christ is divided and it's a mess and it's full of sin. I would not talk about the bride of Christ that way if I was you. What you've got is a bunch of goats and tares among the sheep. And because very little biblical, compassionate church discipline is practiced, they live among the sheep, they feed on the sheep, and they destroy the sheep. And those of you who are leaders in the church are going to pay a high penalty when you stand before the one who loves them. Because you did not have enough courage to stand up and confront the wicked. As a matter of fact, listen to me. The average scenario in North America with regard to churches, by and large, the churches are democracies, and I don't want to get into the ifs or pros or cons of that. But here's what happens. Because the preaching of the gospel is so low, the church is basically, the majority of it are carnal, lost people. And because it is a democracy, they by, by and large govern the direction of the church. And because the pastor doesn't want to lose the great number of people, and because he has wrong ideas regarding evangelism and true conversion, he caters to the wicked in his church. And his little group of true sheep that belong to Jesus Christ are sitting there in the midst of all the theater, in the midst of all the worldliness, in the midst of all the multimedia going, we just want to worship Jesus and we just want someone to teach us the Bible. And pastors are going to pay for that. I have, I'm, it's true. It's just true. You're saying, oh, you're just angry. My dear friend, you know what it costs me to say this? It's true. Trying to keep together a bunch of wicked people while a little flock in the midst of them are starving to death and are made to go in directions they don't want to go with the carnal majority. Listen to me. If my wife was at Walmart late one night and you walked by as a man and you saw that two men were abusing her, three, four, five, ten men were abusing her and hurting her, 
and you put your head down in the name of self-preservation and you walked by, I want to tell you something, my friend. I will not only look for those ten men, I will look for you. It is the bride of Christ and she is precious to Him. It's going to cost you to serve Jesus. It could cost you your church, your reputation, and your denomination, absolutely everything. But the bride of Jesus Christ is worth it. And look what it says. I love this. Look, 39, I will give them one heart and one way. And what is that way? It's Christ and it's holiness. Every true believer I've ever met spoke much of Christ and had a longing desire to be more holy than they were. More conformed to Christ. And look, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear Me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. Oh, what a text that is. But let's just go on really quickly. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. Now, we just read this and, 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 and so many people who are wicked, who are lost, they just go to church on Sunday, they hear this verse, yes, God has made an everlasting covenant with me. He will never turn away from me. Never, never. I am secure because of God's grace. But they fail to read the second part. And look what it says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of Me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from Me. The evidence that God's made an everlasting covenant with you, sir, is that He's put the fear of God in you so that you will not turn away from Him. And if you turn away from Him and He does not discipline you and you continue turning away from Him, it is evidence that He has not put His fear in you, you have not been regenerated, and you have no covenant with God at all. Oh, it's true. The seventh indictment, and we'll just rush through this. And I know that this is misunderstood today, so I'm going to define it. A lack of loving and compassionate church discipline. Most evangelical pastors in America today ought to take Matthew 18 and rip it right out of their Bible. You can't do that, sir. You got to take the whole thing. Many pastors, their theology gets left behind when they come out of their office, out of their study. They're theological in conversation, they're theological in their office, but when they step out, they run the church by carnal means. I am not an elder at my church, and so and have not been there very long, so I can say this without boasting. It practices church discipline. It's a very large church, about a thousand. And um, they estimated they've saved 30 marriages in the last several years through loving, compassionate church discipline that does not begin with excommunication. It begins with ye who are spiritual. We say, oh, I'm too loving. We, we can't practice discipline. We just, we're just too loving. You're more loving than Jesus. He's the one who commanded this. Yeah, it'll cause so much problems. Yeah, you're right. Maybe that's why there's not a the whole lot of problems between the church and culture today because we're not confronting culture. And we don't confront culture just by going out there and picketing Hollywood. We confront culture by obeying God. Noah built the ark and condemned the world. You don't have to have a protest sign. Just walk in obedience and the world will hate you. My dear friend, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Oh, what a wonderful thing. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. It's not that these guys are on your side. They're going to listen and judge. Maybe you're the one that's wrong. Maybe your brother's not in sin. Maybe you're overcritical and legalistic. Who knows? And listen, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. My dear friend, I believe that we need to hear this. We can either start obeying God and disciplining ourselves, or we can have God do it for us.
And maybe the hour is coming and now is when that's going to happen. I'm not talking about critical, legalistic, hateful men. There's enough of those. I'm talking about a man, a group of elders, leaders, who love enough to lay their life on the line because they know this is not a game, this is not something that we do just for this life, that eternity is at stake, the salvation of souls. Look at all these Christian books, stores. Look at the old books of the old days of the Wesleys and the Whitfields and on and on, the Puritans and the Reformation. Most of those books dealt with what is the Gospel? How do you preach it? How do you bring someone to Christ? How do you discern true conversion? How do you be a doctor of souls? We have joined Rome in this matter. Rome, the baby is baptized. The baby is Christian. The baby is Rome. Never again deal with conversion. Just create all sorts of worldly means to try to keep them in the church. Evangelicals have done the same. Pray a little prayer with them after two or three minutes of counseling. After a half an hour of preaching, 25 of which was very funny stories, and then drawing the net after five minutes. Counsel them for a little bit and then declare them saved and then spend the rest of their days discipling them and wondering why they don't grow. I want to submit to you, now I believe in personal one-on-one -on -one discipleship. But my dear friend, the church got along for a thousand or more years without it. Without what we know as personal one-on-one -on -one discipleship with all the books and all the different things. I want you to think about this. One-on-one -on -one discipleship became gigantic in the late 70s. And until today, what was the cry? Just as many people are going out the back door as coming in the front door. And the reason why that's happening is because we're not discipling people. No, the reason why it's happening is because people aren't getting converted. Because His sheep, they hear His voice and they follow Him. Whether you disciple them or not. Now we ought to disciple, but that's not why they're leaving. They went out from us because they were not of us. And they hardly got a chance to be of us because they never heard a true gospel and no one ever dealt with their soul. So we spend a fortune discipling goats, hoping they will become sheep. You can't teach a goat into a sheep. A goat becomes a sheep by the supernatural working of the Spirit of Almighty God. Now, church discipline. I moved my family to this church because they practice church discipline. Because I need to be under church discipline the watchful care of elders and other members who take this seriously. I want my children, if they are converted one day, they're all tiny right now, but if they are converted or they make a profession of faith and then go awry, I want to know that my children will be brought before the church if necessary for the salvation of their soul. Some of you in here would get so mad if a pastor walked up to you and says, honestly, I've been praying about your child and I fear that they're unconverted. You'd get so mad you'd rally up a group to have that pastor kicked out. Instead of realizing, oh, praise God, we got a man of God here. Eighth indictment, a silence on separation. There is a void of serious teaching about holiness. My dear friend, general teaching on holiness, everyone agrees. Let's be holy. We need to be more holy. Let's have a holiness conference. But when you get specific about what that means... That's when everything turns into a turmoil. Pursue peace with all men, the writer of Hebrews tells us, and sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Does anybody believe this? Brother Paul, I have been blamed so often for teaching you know, works. Listen to me. Listen. Again, it goes back to regeneration and the providence of God. If God truly converts a man, He will continue working in that man through teaching and blessing and admonition and discipline. He will see to it that the work He has begun will be finished. And that's why the writer says, without sanctification, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Why? Because if there's no growth in holiness, God's not working in your life. 
If he's not working in your life, it's because you're not a child. Look at the difference between Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Yet God fulfilled all His promises to both of them. Jacob was blessed, Esau was blessed. How did God demonstrate His judgment and wrath against Esau and His love toward Jacob? I'll tell you how. He let Jacob run wild. He let Esau run wild. No, no work of discipline, no work of godliness, nothing. But he beat Jacob to death almost every day of his life. The loving discipline, the correction of God to bring us to holiness. Now, there's so much teaching on this, but let me just say this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, and then go on to 2. Your bodies... Why does he say body? I think to avoid all this super spirituality. Well, I've given Jesus my heart. And you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, as a matter of fact, you can judge a book by its cover. Jesus never said you couldn't judge a book by its cover. He said you could. You will know them by their fruit. And if you think that you've given Him your heart, then He will have your body. And I'll tell you why. The heart, my friend, is not some blood pumping muscle or some figment of a poet's imagination. It refers to the very essence or core of your being. Don't tell me Jesus has the very essence and core of your being and it doesn't affect your body. It's just not going to happen. And so what do we do? We go through Scripture, what, legalistically? No. Drawing inferences? No. Just standing on the commands of Scripture. About what? I do not agree with everything the Puritans said, but I love the Puritans. And one of the reasons why I love them, because I believe they honestly made an attempt to bring everything in their life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Their mind! Because they wrote 800 page books on what should I think about according to the Scriptures? What should not enter into my mind according to the Scriptures? What should I do with my eyes? What should go in these ears and what should not go in these ears? How should the tongue be ruled? What should be the direction of my life? And yes, I'm going to scare you to death. How should I dress? Now here, I want to be careful here. don't want to draw inferences and things. My dear friend, my wife says it this way. If your clothing is a frame for your face from which the glory of Christ springs forth, it is of God. But if your clothing is a frame for your body, it is sensual and God hates it. Enough said? Now, I can't go through everything of holiness, and holiness isn't just outward expression, but we've become to be a people that uses the interior work of the Spirit as an excuse to say nothing is ever going to happen on the outside. And that is not true. Some of you young men, you cry out probably more than I do that the Spirit of God would fill you and work in you, but it only takes one half hour of television to so grieve Him, He'll be a miles from you. 99% pure, 1% sewer, I'm not drinking. One time I was struggling and Leonard Ravenhill was talking to a dear friend of mine who was saying, Brother Leonard, young man, Brother Paul, he's really struggling. And he sent a track. I still got that track. I'll never, never part with that. And said, others can, you cannot. I don't necessarily agree with everything. Young man, listen to me. I don't go to malls. I don't. Not because I'm more holy than you, it's because I know what I am. There's a story of a, one of the finest, greatest violinists in Europe playing his final concert, old man. And when he finished, a young man walked up to him, violinist, and said, Sir, I'd give my life to play like you. And the old man said, Son, I have given my life to play like me. 
I want the power of God on my life, then something's got to go. I want to know Him, then some separation has to occur. Let me tell you something, young man. Everyone else is running around to all their little retreats and all their conferences and getting together with group hugs and singing Kumbaya and everything else. Maybe you need to get alone in the wilderness with God and fast for seven days on your knees studying the book of Psalms. It's being alone with God. Belonging to Him. To be a man of God, there's got to be a sense where sometimes even your wife, who is of your own flesh, one with her, she looks you in the eye and she knows she can't go where you're going. Silence on separation. I think, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Nothing. What fellowship has light with darkness? Nothing. Darkness is the opposite of God's revelation. Or what harmony? Christ with Belial? Nothing. Or what has the believer in common with the unbeliever? Nothing. He says, come out from their midst. Come out from the midst of what? Come out from the midst of lawlessness, darkness, satanic devices, and the life and worldliness of the unbeliever. Come out from it. Now the ninth indictment. And this is very important to me as an as a older man with a young family. Didn't get married until I was 30. My wife had something of a little brain tumor for the first eight years. We couldn't have children. And then, oh, praise God, a child was born. And then another. And then another. And then, who knows? <laughs> Psychology and sociology have replaced the Scriptures with regard to the family. My dear friend, pastors, leaders, think about this. Our churches, our, our Sunday morning services, better said, are so cosmetic. Just because there seems to be beautiful worship and the sermon went well and people seem to be moved, that's not evidence. I'll tell you what evidence is. The home, the marriages, the families. Judges 17, 6, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every did, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. If I talk to people, because I go for all kinds, I find a godly man who has raised godly children, and I go and I latch on to him. But in most cases, you know what I find out? The people I talk to in church, all of it is wives' tales and sociology and this and that and every other thing. What's right in their own eyes and can't give me one biblical verse. But every once in a while I find a man and a woman who set themselves to set their family according to Scripture. And the difference is overwhelming. When I'm on an airplane, I love to do this. Men will sit down beside me and they'll go, What do you do? I go, oh, I'm a husband. They say, yeah, what else do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm a father. What else do you do? Well, if I have any time left over, I preach a little. What does it matter if a man win the whole world and lose his family? Let, let me just put it to you this way. Based upon what are you raising your children and loving your wife? Based upon what? If you can't start going into Scriptures right now and pulling them apart and showing me how your family's founded upon it, I can assure you, you are a captive of psychology, sociology, the whims and the lies of this age. You see, you don't have the right to do... You have no authority, sir, apart from the Word of God. Look at Genesis 18:19. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. What a beautiful thing. And listen, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, well, verse 2 tells us that the will of God is perfect. So if you ever come up with this idea as a man of God, 
I am sacrificing my family for the sake of the ministry, I will tell you, you are a bald-faced liar. You are sacrificing your family for the sake of the little kingdom you're trying to build. Because the will of God is perfect. That means I do not have to violate the will of God with regard to my family in order to fulfill the will of God with regard to the ministry. God doesn't need you. He does desire that you be obedient. That you be obedient. Now, I just want to give you two examples. Now, before... It's like when someone asked me one time, Brother Paul, are you against evangelism? I said, yes and no. I'm not against biblical evangelism, but I'm against the way you're doing it. Are you against Sunday school and youth groups? Yes and no. I want to explain something to you. Now, for some of you, I'm not going to be enough, and for some of you, I'm going to be too much. I just want to use these two things to point out what's wrong with us. Sunday school. No matter what denomination you're a part of, if you are a part of some denomination that's kind of organized, I can assure you that your denomination spends multi-millions of dollars on Sunday school material. Multi-millions of dollars on conferences, on teaching teachers how to teach Sunday school, on doing everything in the book to promote Sunday school. I know that for a fact. Let me ask you. How much money does your denomination spend and how many conferences and man hours are put in to teach fathers to teach their children? So now you found it, haven't you? God doesn't have a plan B. He has a plan A. You circumvent plan A, plan B won't work. Now I'm not saying that children can't come together in groups and be catechized or be taught or anything, but if that ever even begins to hint to supplant the ministry of the Father in the home, blow it to pieces. Do you see what I'm saying? Look at just, just that one tiny instance. Everything for Sunday school, everything for Sunday school. But there's hardly a conference in this entire country to teach men how to teach their children. And most of the time in the Sunday school, it's nothing more than entertainment because the Sunday school teacher doesn't have the authority to discipline your child. And even if they did, they wouldn't do it because they don't believe in it. That's just one tiny instance. Let's look at youth groups. Well, youth need to be together. You know, they need to be together. Okay, well, let's look. Proverbs 13.20 He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion, companion of fools will suffer harm. Whoever told you youth ought to be together? Whoever told you that? I'll tell you who told you that. 1960s. Psychologists. Generation gap. Youth are to be with adults so that they stop acting like naive fools and join adulthood and put away foolishness which leads to destruction. Now I'm not saying you can't bring youth together, but I submit if you do have all their parents there. And you say, well what about the lost youth that come into our church? Well what are they seeing now? You're, the lost youth come into your Christian youth in church and they see almost the same thing they see in their own home. No parents. Kids teaching kids. Or one guy a little bit older with moose in his hair teaching your kids. But what would happen if lost youth came into your church and they saw the children there, the youth, in a loving, wonderful relationship collectively with their parents. And they would go, Whoa, I've never seen anything like this before. His dad, look at him. He, he lo I mean, he loves his dad. I mean, look at the... So is this Christianity? You see, my dear friend, let's say that... I am no doctor, but a man comes up to me with a bleeding forehead and he says, Brother Paul, I, I've been everywhere. No one can diagnose my problem. And I said, well, I'm no doctor, but I'll follow you around for 24 hours. And I notice that every time the hour strikes, if it strikes one, he hits himself in the head with a brick one time. If 
it strikes two, he hits himself in the head twice with a brick. If it strikes twelve, he hits himself twelve times in the head with a brick. After observing this cautiously and carefully, taking notes for 24 hours, I come up to him and I say, you know, I think I have figured out your problem. I'm no doctor, but I think I figured out your problem. It is that pathetic among us, church. Why do our children do what they do? Why is everything... It's like one old dear saint, someone asked him one time, he wouldn't let his teenage son go out with a young lady to be in some private place. He said, don't you trust your son? He said, no, I don't trust my son. <laughs> Whatever made you think that? I don't trust his dad. I wouldn't put his father alone with a woman that wasn't his wife. And yet I have much more to lose than a boy. I have much more control of my will than a teenager with raging hormones. So what would, you, what would make you ever think I would do that? We violate biblical principle after biblical principle after biblical principle and then we wonder why everything is a mess. Lastly, just real quick, turn with me. You know when I say real quick, I am speaking an allegory or something. Uh, Go to 1 Timothy. I was listening a few months ago at the, all the horrendous things that are happening to our, I don't know what you would call it anymore, republic, democracy, country, I'm not really sure. Socialistic state. And I was so burdened as I sat there listening and I was saying, oh God, what can I do? I, I, right now, Lord, I, I, honestly, with all that is in me, I'll jump in the middle of the fire. I, I'll, there's a charging rhino. I'll jump in front of it. Just tell me what to do. Do you want me to go to Washington and just stand in front of the White House and preach till they throw me in jail? I'm tired of just preaching to Christians and in churches and all this. God, just the country's going to hell. Just throw me. Just, what do you want me to do? Just throw me at them. Verse 1 of chapter 4, But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the face. 1 Timothy 4.1 Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, he goes on to basically tell young Timothy that all hell is going to break loose in culture. That everything is just going to be maddening. Men as beasts. I was with Conrad Mbewe a few months ago and I heard him preach. They call him the Spurgeon of Africa and rightly so. If you get a chance to listen to him, listen to him. He's one of my favorite preachers in the world. And he said this, he said, in Africa we no longer fear beasts. We don't run from beasts. We fear men and run from men. He was talking, of course, about depravity. But he said here that just the world's going to come unglued, Timothy. Now, what does he say to do? Verse 6, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the words of faith. And right there, this text just started unraveling for me. Paul, yeah. The world has lost its mind. Everything is going to happen. It's under my providence. But listen to me. Here should be your reaction in the midst of all hell breaking loose, in the midst of apostasy, in the midst of persecution. Here's what you need to do. Be constantly nourished on the words of faith. We always want to run out there and do something. We want to fix something. God is seeking men of character. Polished swords. First of all, son, be constantly nourished on the words of faith and the sound doctrine which you have been following. This you have been following is very important. I think it's indicating to us that a simple intellectual study of Scripture will not, will not achieve the goal that God has for His men. They must obey it. They must begin following it. You cannot learn doctrine well until you follow the doctrine you learn. 
And then he says this, he says, Have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. My dear friend, let me tell you something. All this emergent church stuff, much of the church growth stuff, all the cultural sensitivity, throwing out the window, biblical sensitivity, it's just a bunch of little boys wanting to play church without the power of God on their life. And I'll stand on that statement. It's a lesser than David trying to fit himself in Saul's armor to the wind with it. The more you trust in the arm of the flesh, the less you're going to see of the power of God. He says this, On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Man of God, you want revival. So do I. We need an army though. If powerful swords, if mighty flaming pikes and swords and weaponries are to be dropped out of heaven for us to fight, then we must be the caliber of men who can yield those things and wield those things and fight with them with sound character. We should discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Young men, discipline yourself to prayer. Discipline yourself to the systematic reading of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation over and over and over and over again. Discipline yourself in your speech. Discipline yourself in the company you keep. Discipline yourself in when you go to bed and when you rise up. This is a war. Discipline yourself. Young men, I can tell you this. Unless you are some exception, being born in the age that you have been born, if you're under 30, yea, even under 40, you probably lack discipline. Because you have never been able to work. You have never had need to work for your food, and your fathers never made you work so hard that your bones cried. The men who have accomplished much and been used of God have been men of labor in the ministry. This is hard and it will cost you everything. And by the time you're an old man, you will be broken but strong in the things of God. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Oh, my dear friend. Who cares about your best life now? Eternity! The day you stand in those granite halls before the Lord of glory and kings. The greatest men on earth are divided and split and culled. Some cast into eternal hell and some invited into eternal glory. Live for eternity! These Olympians, how, well, how majestic they are, but only for a moment. They start training when they're four and five years old. They never do anything but train until they're 22. They run a nine-second race for a medal they hang up, and that's it. Cannot you give equal for eternal things? Some of the greatest men of God have been men very limited in their, bo in their bodies, in their abilities, they were so limited that they had to focus themselves into one thing. To the ministry. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive because we fixed our hope on the living God. This is not some martyr thing in which we uselessly give our lives to nothing only to be pulverized without hope. No! We serve God and God will honor us. We have fixed our hope on that and that gives us strength. Strength. Oh, this life is a vapor. I'm 47, but yesterday I was 21. Where did it all go? It is a vapor. While you have strength, preach. I praise God that in His providence as a young man, I spent myself in the Andes Mountains and in the jungles of Peru doing what I no longer have the strength to do. While you are a young man, while there is strength in you, labor with all your might. Take those stupid video games of yours and crush them under your feet. 
throw the TV out the window. You were made for greater things than these. To see if you really know Him. You see, my dear friend, I have great assurance when I study my own conversion, when I discuss it with other men, when I look over the 25 years of my pilgrimage with Christ, I have great assurance of having come to know Him. But even now, if I were to depart from the faith and walk away and keep going in that direction into heresy, into worldliness, it could be the greatest of proofs that I never knew Him, that the whole thing was a work of the flesh. I know what I'm saying is, out, is outstanding to you. You think, oh my, I've never heard such a thing. This is the old... Read Pilgrim's Progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Preserve in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself for those who hear you. May God bless His church. It's a tremendous privilege for me to be here this afternoon with you. Before we begin with any further speaking, I would also like to go to the Lord in prayer. And I would ask you to pray. There's so much going on here this afternoon, so much that you don't understand. But I'll tell you where I'm coming from. I'll preach as a dying man to dying men and women and youth. And I will preach as though I will never preach again. And I will tell you things that you will misunderstand. And I will tell you things that make you so angry with me. And I'll tell you things that you will deny and I will tell you things and you will say, I have no right to tell you what I'm telling you. But before you come to any conclusion about what is being said here this afternoon, you ask yourself one question. You see, preaching is a very dangerous thing. It's dangerous for me. Because the Bible says that false teachers will undergo greater condemnation. If what I tell you today is not true, I'm in a great deal of trouble and have every right to do this with fear and trembling because I will stand condemned before God. But if what I tell you today is true, then you're the one with cause for fear and trembling. Because if I correctly interpret this passage of Scripture that I'm going to give you, it is as though God were speaking through a man. And your problem will not be with me. It will be with God and His Word. So the only question that really has to be decided here this afternoon is, is this man before us a false prophet? Or is he telling us the truth? And if he is telling us the truth, 
then nothing else matters except conforming our lives to that truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Father, I am so small and so pitiful, Father, in so many ways. You know, Lord, You know. But oh, dear God, should false fire be the only thing ever placed on Your altar? Or could fire come down from heaven amidst all the noise and the clamor and the activities? Could fire come down from heaven? Can these dead bones live? You know, Lord. In Your sovereignty, I pray and I beg before the throne of God that You would be gracious to us that You would open up hearts and minds. Lord, we can't wait for them to open up theirs. They never will. Open up their hearts and their minds and cause them to see biblical truth. Breathe on them. Grant them repentance. Grant them faith. Bring them into Your kingdom, Lord, for Your own glory. For the sake of Your own great name, do this thing. Lord, as the brother said, let it be so, Lord, so that no man will take credit for it, so that no man would lay his hand to the ark of God, and if he did, that you'd strike him down dead, Lord. Oh, God, move among us. Please. Because we have no other hope. We have no other hope. These children have no other hope except that you move. Amen. I will be teaching from Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, follow with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. I stand here today. I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself, whether or not life is turning out like you want it to turn out, or whether or not your checkbook is balanced. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. 
There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. You say, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? I can say such a thing because I don't do my Christian work in America. I spend most of my time preaching in South America, in Africa, and Eastern Europe. And I want you to know that when you take a look at American Christianity, it is based more upon a godless culture than it is upon the Word of God. And so many people are deceived. And so many youth are deceived. And so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer one time in their life, they're going to heaven. And then when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also just as worldly as the world, and they compare themselves by themselves, nothing troubles their heart. They think, well, I'm the same as most in my youth group. I watch things I shouldn't watch on television and laugh about the very things that God hates. I wear clothing that is sensual. I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much that's in the world. But bless God, I am a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I don't look any different than most of the other people in my church. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I want you to know that the greatest heresy in the American evangelical and Protestant church is that if you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, He will definitely come in. You will not find that in any place in Scripture. You will not find that anywhere in Baptist history until about 50 years ago. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin. A hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. I didn't come here to get amens. I didn't come here to be applauded. I'm talking about you. People so many times come up to me and they say, Oh, I'd love to follow you into Romania. I'd love to follow you into the Ukraine. I'd love to preach where you preached and planted churches in Peru in the jungle. And I tell them, No, you wouldn't. They say, Yes, I would. I say, No, you wouldn't. Why? Because you'd be excommunicated from the church down there. What we need to see, I'm not trying to be hard for the sake of being hard. Do you realize how much love it takes to stand before 5,000 people and tell them that American Christianity is almost totally wrong? Do you know what it's going to cost me to never be asked back again to something like this? To be unpopular? Do you know why you do it? You don't do it because you get paid well. You don't do it because men love you. You do it because you love men and because more than that you want to honor God. I want to tell you something. We are going to go into Scripture and I want you to look at it as it really is. Stop comparing yourself with others who call themselves Christians, who compare themselves with others who call themselves Christians. Compare yourself to the Scripture. When someone, a young person, comes to a pastor or a youth minister and says, I'm not sure whether or not I'm saved, the youth minister will usually throw out a cliché. Well, was there ever a time in your life when you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart? Well, yes. Were you sincere? Well, I don't know, but I think so. Well, you need to tell Satan to stop bothering you. Did you write it in the back of your book, the back of the Bible, like the evangelist told you when you got saved, to write down the date so that any time you doubted, you could point him to the Bible? What superstition has overcome our denomination? You know what the Bible tells Christians to do? Examine yourself. Test yourself in light of Scripture to see if you are in the faith. Test yourself to see if you're Christian. Do you realize if I dismissed us right now and told everyone to go knock on every door in this city, do you know what we would find out? 99% of the people, at least in this city, believe themselves to be believers. 
If you go back to your hometown and knock on every door, because I went back to my hometown after I got saved and knocked on every door. And you know what I found out? Everyone in my town is a Christian. 85% of them do not go to church. And those who do go to church are not concerned about holiness. They're not concerned about serving. They're not concerned about being separate from the world. They're not concerned about the gospel being preached among the nations. But bless God, they're saved. Why are they saved? Because some evangelist who should have spent less time preaching and more time studying his Bible told them they were saved. And he did it so that he could brag about how many people came forward in his next revival. I love you. And there are men here who love you. And I want to go into Scripture now. Now that I've shocked you into life, I want you to listen to me. Listen to the Word of God and begin to ask yourself some questions. First of all, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. There is a narrow gate. And you know, historically, one of the reasons I'm a Southern Baptist is because the Southern Baptists have always been quick. When other denominations have failed to realize this, the Southern, Southern Baptists have always been quick to realize that there is one gate. There is one God. There is one mediator between God and man, and His name is Jesus Christ. It's not multiple choice. Not every road leads to Rome. As a denomination, we have always told people what Jesus told people. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Me. So I praise God for that. That the only way any human being on this earth will ever be saved is through Jesus Christ. And that is all. Because you need to realize the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and you have no idea what that means. That we were born radically depraved and God-hating. That we would have never sought God, never come to God. We have rebelled against God, broken every law. It's not just an issue that you have sinned. The issue is you've never done anything but sin. The Bible says in the prophets that even our greatest works are like filthy rags before God. And because of that, you know what we deserve? The wrath of God. The holy hatred of God. You say, now wait a minute. God doesn't hate anybody. God is love. No, my friend. You need to understand something. Jesus Christ taught, the prophets taught, the apostles taught this. That apart from the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord, the only thing left for you is the wrath the fierce anger of God because of your rebellion and your sin. When I speak in universities, they're always quick to point out, no, God cannot hate because God is love. And I tell you, God must hate because God is love. You see, I love children, therefore I hate abortion. If I love that which is holy, I must hate that which is unholy. God is a holy God. That's something that the Americans have forgotten. Many of the things that you love to do, God hates. Did you know that? Pray for revival. You're going to have a youth meeting. You want God to move. But before you go there, you watch programs on television that God absolutely despises. And then you wonder why the Holy Spirit hasn't fallen on a place and why you have to create false fire and false excitement. Because God's not in it. God is a holy God. And the only way you and I could ever be reconciled to a holy God is through the death of God's own Son. When He hung on that tree. Now listen to me. If you're saved here tonight, you're not saved because the Romans and Jews rejected Jesus. You're not saved because they put a crown of thorns on His head. You're not saved because they ran a spear through His side. And you're not saved even because they nailed Him to a cross. Do you know why you're saved if you are saved? Because when Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, He bore your sin, the sin of God's people, and all the fierce wrath of God that should fall upon you fell upon His only begotten Son. Someone had to pay that price. Someone had to die. It was God the Father who crushed His only begotten Son, according to Isaiah 53. It says it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. 
People say the cross is a sign of how much man is worth. That's not true. The cross is a sign of how depraved we really are. That it took the death of God's own Son. The only thing that could save a people like us was the death of God's own Son under the wrath of His own Father paying the price. Rising again from the dead. Powerful to save. This is the Gospel of Jesus. Now what are you called upon to do? You say you go through the narrow gate. How do you do that? Jesus said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What must you do? In Mark, He tells us, repent and believe the Gospel. You say, Brother Paul, I got saved by praying and asking Jesus Christ into my heart. And I'm sure you did. But you weren't saved by a magic formula or some words you repeated after someone else. You were saved because you repented of your sins and you believed. And not only did you do that in the past, you continue to do it even until now. Because when Jesus, a proper translation of that verse He gave, is this, the kingdom of God has come. The time is fulfilled. Now, spend the rest of your life repenting of your sins and believing in Me. Conversion is not like a flu shot. Oh, I did that. I repented. I believed. The question is, my friend, are you continuing to repent of sin? Are you continuing to believe? Because He who began a good work in you will finish it. He will finish it. Now we as Southern Baptists preach that you're supposed to go through that own one and only gate which is Jesus Christ. But we as Southern Baptists have forgot something. And I want youth ministers and pastors and everyone to listen to me. Parents, we have forgot a very important teaching in the Gospel. It says that not only the gate is narrow, it says the path is narrow. What we basically do is lead someone to Christ, lead someone in a prayer, and then they spend the rest of their life living just like the world. And if you deny me on this, I can bring the statistics to prove you wrong. Gallup poll, Barnum polls, every kind of poll you can possibly look at, when it questions the morality of the church in America against the morality of those who claim to be lost in America, the polls find no difference. Now that is statistics. has nothing to do with religious interpretation. Those are statistics. Book after book is being churned out by theologian and philosopher and, and sociologist alike. What has happened to the church? We find out that abortion in the church is just as prevalent as outside the, in the world. We find that divorce is just as prevalent. We find that immorality. You know as well as I do there are youth here right now who are practicing immorality and yet worshiping God in the same breath. You know there are youth here that are doing drugs and yet coming to youth group. You know, watching and doing things that are not appropriate for a Christian, and yet they're coming to the youth group, believe themselves satisfied, believe themselves saved, and no one is saying anything except this. They're carnal Christians. They're really Christians. They're just carnal. That was a doctrine that started in a Baptist seminary that is not a Southern Baptist seminary several decades ago. It is not biblical and it is not historical. My dear friend, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. You say, now wait a minute, Brother Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Are ye not carnal? Paul said that. No. That's what Paul said. You need to read the whole book to find out what he meant. You see, one of our problems, youth, listen to me. Most of our Christianity is based on cliches that we read on the back of Christian t-shirts. Most of our Christianity comes from songwriters and not the Bible. Most of what we believe to be true is dictated to us by our culture and not by the Bible. The Bible never teaches that a person can be a genuine Christian and live in continuous carnality and wickedness and sin all the days of their life. But the Bible teaches that the genuine Christian has been given a new nature. The genuine Christian has a father who loves them and disciplines them and watches over them and cares for them. 
My heart is breaking because you know as well as I do, young people. Let's not be hypocrites about it. Let's not hide it. There are so many. You know them. You might be one of them or you at least know that they're in your youth group. They come to youth group. They do all the stuff, but in their heart they're as wicked as wicked can be. There's no difference. There's no light. Everything that the world does, they do, and it's appropriate. It's okay. My friend, that's not Christianity. They're not in danger of losing their reward. They're in danger of hell. They know not God. What do we teach? When was the last time you heard someone say, there's not only a narrow gate into heaven, but a narrow way? Jesus indicates that one of the principal signs of being a genuine Christian is that you walk in the narrow way. Do you know what the sign for being a genuine Christian is in America is? You prayed a prayer one time. Isn't that amazing? What are you asked if you doubt your salvation? Did you pray a prayer one time? What does Scripture teach? Examine yourselves, test yourselves in the light of Scripture to see if you're in the faith because a Christian will be different. Now, I'm, am I saying that a Christian is without sin? No, because in 1 John we learn that Christians do sin. And if any man does not acknowledge a sin, he knows not God. He's not walking in the light. So what is the difference? What am I really getting at? What am I getting at is this. If you are genuinely a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And if you step off that path of righteousness... The Father will come for you. He will discipline you. He will put you back on that path. But if you profess to have gone through the narrow gate and yet you live in the broad way, just like all the other people in your high school, just like all the other people who are carnal and wicked, the Bible wants you to know that you should be terribly, terribly afraid. But you know not God. I fear men who have spent most of their life telling other men that they are saved. I fear you if you've done that. You don't tell men they are saved. You tell men how to be saved. God tells them they are saved. What we have forgotten to believe is that salvation is a supernatural work of God. And those who have genuinely been converted, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be a new creature. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So we find out here in Scripture that there is a narrow gate and a narrow way. We go into 16, go into verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. One of the things you need to realize is this. Something a wise man told me a long time ago. He said, Paul, your best friend is the one who tells you the most truth. In America, we have become so thin-skinned that no one can rebuke us. No one can tell us we are wrong. And ministers and leaders alike have bought into this lie. We do not want to offend. We want to be seeker friendly. What you need to realize is there is only one seeker and his name is God. And if you want to be friendly to somebody in your church, you need to be friendly to God. And you need to be more concerned for the glory of God than you are the attitudes of men. But another thing you need to realize is the person who loves you most will tell you the most truth. One of the greatest distinguishing marks of a false prophet is that he will always tell you what you want to hear. He will never rain on your parade. He will get you clapping. He will get you jumping. He will make you dizzy. He will keep you entertained. And he will present a Christianity to you that will make your church look like a six flags over Jesus. And keep you so entertained you are never addressed with great issues such as these. Is God working in my life? Am I growing in holiness? Have I truly been born again? Listen to me. If everyone in this town believes themselves saved, and we know that's not true by Scripture because the Bible says that few will enter in, how do you know that you're saved? How do you truly know that you are saved? Because someone told you? Because you prayed a prayer? Because you believed? 
Well, let me ask you a question. How do you know you believe? Because everybody says they believe. How do you know you're not like them? Do you know how the Bible teaches you that you know you are saved? Do you know how Baptist theology up until about 50 years ago would have told you how you know you have been saved? You know you have been saved because your life is in a process of being changed and your style of life is one of walking in the paths of God's truth. And when you step off those paths in disobedience as we all do, God comes for you and puts you back on the path. One of the greatest evidences that you have truly been born again is that God will not let you talk as your flesh might want to talk. God will not let you dress as the sensual world and the sensual church allows you to dress. God will not allow you to act like the world, smell like the world, speak like the world, listen to the things that the world listens to. God will make a difference in your life. He says here, as we go on, verse 17, so every... Or let's go to 16. You will know them by their fruit. How will you know a false prophet in the wider application here in all of Scripture? How will you know if someone is a genuine Christian? By their fruit. By their fruit, my dear friend. Look at your life. Look at the way you walk. Look at the way you talk. Look at the passions of your heart. Is Jesus in there somewhere? Or is He just some accessory that you add on to your life? Is He just something you do on Wednesday or Sunday? Is He something that you give a mental assent to? Is He an accessory or is He the very center of your life? And what is the fruit that you're bearing? Do you look like the world, act like the world? Do you have and experience the same joys that the world experiences? Can you love sin and relish it? Can you love rebellion and relish it? Then you know not God. You will know them by their fruit. God has the power to change them. Let's imagine for a moment Jesus teaching this passage. And you're sitting out there listening. And He looks at you. He says, Thistles. Thistles. Um, do you find thistles on, on fig trees? And you respond, of course not, Jesus. I mean, you're not an agriculturalist. You're not a farmer. I mean, you're a carpenter. But I mean, everybody knows Jesus. You don't find thorns on fig trees? Well, well, then let me ask you another question. Do you find figs, good fruit, on thorn trees? Why, no, Jesus, that's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, you're never going to find thorns on a fig tree, and you're not going to find figs on a thorn tree. Jesus, to say that that could be possible, anyone who tells you that, Jesus, you can mark it down. They're either crazy or they're a liar. And then Jesus responds to you, Well then, those who call themselves my disciples and bear bad fruit, would not it be the same to say that they were either lying or out of their mind to make such a statement? Let me take it a little further. Let's imagine that I show up late and I run up here on the platform. And, and the, every, all the leaders are angry with me. I said, Brother Paul, don't you appreciate the fact you're giving the opportunity to speak here and you come late? And I said, Brothers, you have to forgive me. Well, why? Well, I, I was out here on the highway and I was driving and I had a flat tire and, and I got out to change the tire and when I was changing the tire, the lug nut fell off and I wasn't paying attention that I was on the highway and I ran out and I grabbed the lug nut and as soon as I picked it up in the middle of the highway, I stood up and there was a 30-ton logging truck going 120 miles an hour, about 10 yards in front of me, and it ran me over and that's why I'm late. Now, there would only be two logical... I know... No one studies logic anymore, but there would only be two logical conclusions. One, I'm a liar. Or two, I'm a madman. You would say, Brother Paul, it's absolutely absurd. It is impossible, Brother Paul, to have an encounter 
with something as large as a logging truck and not be changed? And then my question would be to you, what is larger, a logging truck or God? How is it that so many people today profess to have had an encounter with Jesus Christ and yet they are not permanently changed? Let me give you a few things to think about. You know I'm telling you the truth. How many times do you go and rededicate your life over and over and over again? How many times do youth groups go to things like this and get fired up and go back to the church and it lasts about a week and a half? And yet, oh, it was a great move of God. No, it wasn't. If it doesn't last, it wasn't a great move of God. It was emotion. It was so many things, but it wasn't a great move of God. Has God worked in your life? Is God working in your life? You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Now we go on. Verse 19, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruit. Look at this. You need to understand something about Hebrew literature. When you and I want to emphasize something, do you know what we do? We raise our voice. If we're writing, we put it in bold letters or we capitalize it. But to a Jew, it's different. When he wants to emphasize something, he repeats it. And he repeats it. That's why you find Hebrew parallelisms in the book of Proverbs. The wicked shall not live in the land. The wicked shall be destroyed. He's saying the same thing, just in a different way to give greater emphasis. That's what Jesus is doing over and over again here. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by the path that they walk in. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. And he says, anyone who does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is he talking about? My dear friend, he is talking about the judgment of Almighty God that will one day fall upon the world. That will one day fall possibly upon you. Oh, dear friend, I cannot look into your heart. I am so easily deceived by my own heart. But there is one who is not deceived. There is one who is not deceived and he's not deceived by a contemporary Christian culture. He knows. You will know them by their fruit. Then he goes on. He says this, Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do you know what your profession of faith in Jesus Christ is worth? Absolutely nothing. Yes. Did you read that passage? Study it. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who professes, Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There are many people who are going to profess Lord, Lord, but they are not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. My dear, precious child, are you one of them? Lord, Lord. Now, again, let's go back to Hebrew literature. He said Lord, Lord. He didn't say Lord. He said, Lord, Lord. What does that mean? This fellow who is making this profession, he is not someone who just all of a sudden decided it's judgment and I better profess him to be Lord. This is a person who emphatically declares to other people that Jesus Christ is Lord. He walks around saying, Lord. He dances up in front while the musicians are playing saying, Lord. He sings the songs, Lord. But Jesus said to him, depart from me, I never knew you. Do you know... Billy Graham is one of the kindest, lovingest men. Yet Billy Graham has said he believed that a great majority of people who attend Bible-believing churches are lost. He said that he would be happy if even 5% of all the people who made professions of faith in his campaigns were even saved. When I'm in Nigeria, I was there last year visiting a mother who's whose son was in our church and was martyred. 
by the Muslims. In northern Nigeria, when someone professes faith in Jesus Christ, you pretty much know it, it's, it's true. Why? They can die because of that profession. But in America, oh, consider the cost. Think, examine your life in light of Scripture. Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Because not everyone who says to Him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what does it say here? Look what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the sign that someone has become a genuine Christian? I wish that we would start teaching this again. What happened to our theology? What happened to our doctrine? What happened to our teaching? It went right out the window. No one wants to study doctrine anymore. They just want to listen to songs and read the back of Christian t-shirts. What happened to truth? Truth tells you this. The evidence, the way that you can have assurance that you are genuinely a born-again Christian is that you do as a style of life the will of the Father. You say, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not. I'm talking about evidence of faith. And it goes like this. Your profession of faith is no proof that you're born again because everybody in this whole country professes faith in Jesus Christ. Barnard tells us that 65 to 70 percent of all Americans are saved. Born again Christians. Most godless country on the face of the earth. Kill 4,000 babies today, a day, but bless God, 70 percent of us are born again. How do you know that that faith you have is not false? A style of life that is concerned about doing the will of the Father, that practices the will of the Father, and when you disobey the will of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes and reprimands you, either personally, through the written Word of God, through a brother or sister in Christ, and God puts you back on the path again. If you're a genuine Christian, you cannot escape Him. Let me give you an example. If I was your pastor, and you were, let's say, 14 years old, and I came back from preaching at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I saw you standing out there in a park or on a corner with a bunch of hoodlums doing things you shouldn't be doing. And you were a member of our church. I would tell you, get in the car. I would take you home to your father. I wouldn't be mad at you. I'd be mad at your father. I would tell him, sir, you are a derelict father that you would allow your child to be out in such circumstances. I want you to know something. God is not a derelict father. If you can play around in sin, if you can love the world and love the things of the world, if you can always be involved in the world and doing things of the world, if your heroes are worldly people, if you want to look like them and act like them, if you practice the same things they practice, oh my dear friend, listen to my voice, there's a good chance you know not God and you do not belong to Him. Now, bring this to close. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You say the most important thing on the face of the earth is to know Jesus Christ. That is not true. The most important thing on the face of the earth is that Jesus Christ knows you. It, I'm not going to get into the White House tomorrow because I walk up to the gate and tell everybody I know George Bush. But they will let me in if George Bush comes out and says, I know Paul Washer. You can profess to know Jesus, but my question for you, do you know Jesus? Does Jesus know you? And look how he describes the lost man here. He says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In Greek, anomia. A negative particle, ah, not. Word namas, law, no law. And this is what it means. Let me give you an accurate translation of this. Depart from me. Listen to me. If I could come out there and hug you while I was telling you this, I would. Listen to me. He says, depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, who confessed me as Lord, and yet you live as though I never gave you a law to obey. I just described a great majority of North American Christianity. If anyone starts talking about law, if anyone starts talking about biblical principles on what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do, how we're to live and not supposed to live, everyone starts screaming legalists. Legalists. 
But Jesus said, Depart from Me, those of you who lived, you called Me Lord, but you lived as though I had never given a law. In American Christianity today, pass through the gate, praise God, live like the rest of the world, and it's okay, you're just carnal, maybe one day you'll come back. Do you know what happens because of our bad evangelism? We have gazillions of children saved in vacation Bible school. When they hit 15 years old, they enter into the world and live like demons, a great majority of them. And then when they're around 30, they come back and rededicate their life. Maybe they just got saved. Because folks, it's more than just telling someone you're saved because you acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Satan acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. Is your life in a process of change? And then he drops down, he talks about two people, two foundations. Do you know what this passage in contemporary... See, it's important to study theology and it's important to study history. The contemporary interpretation of this passage about the rock and the sand is basically like this. If you're a Christian, you need to build your life upon the rock. Because if you build your life upon the sand, you'll be an unhappy Christian and your life won't go right. That is not what Jesus is teaching and history backs me up on it. It was hardly ever interpreted that way. you know what the interpretation is? It goes like this. There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on? There are two types of trees. There is a good tree that bears good fruit and is going to heaven. There's a bad tree and you know it's bad because it bears bad fruit and it's going to hell. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. There are those who profess Jesus as Lord and they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And there are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and they do not do the will of the Father who is in heaven and they go to hell. Not because of a lack of works, but because of a lack of faith demonstrated by the fact that they had no works. And then he goes on. This is not two Christians building their house on two different foundations. No, this again is a saved man and a lost man. The lost man hears the Word of God preached, but he lays no foundation. You cannot see in any way in his life how the Word of God is forming and building and sustaining his life. His life is not... How many people in the Southern Baptist Convention, regardless of all our numbers, regardless of everything we say, if we were to simply take this passage and compare the people to this passage and say, are you building your marriage on the Word of God? Are you raising your children on the Word of God? Are you doing your finances on the Word of God? Are you living, separating yourself from the things of this world based upon the Word of God? How many would be able to answer? Or positively. No. None of that. I profess Jesus. He's my Savior. And my Sunday school teacher told me so. Oh, I know, like Leonard Ravenhill, an acquaintance of mine, before he passed on, used to say, I preach in a lot of Baptist churches once. I preach in a lot of places like this once. I could have got up here today with a vocabulary that would have astounded you and preached you things that would have lifted you up and floated you around this room. I could have told you stories that would have made you laugh and stories about dogs and grandmas that would have made you cry. But I love you too much for that. I know, I know because the Word of God is true that there are people who believe themselves to be saved and they're no more saved or not. I know that there are some of you who look around and you think, well, I'm saved. I mean, look, I look like everybody else in my youth group. What makes you think your youth group is saved? Well, I'm like my parents or I'm like the adults in my church or the deacon or the pastor. What does that matter? You won't be judged by them on the day of His coming. My question for you, beloved, my question for you, little child, I mean, you could be my children. And I pray someday when my little boy grows that there will be a preacher who will stand before him and say, Enough of this! Let's get down! What does the Word of God say? How does your life stand in front of that blazing fire which is the holiness of God? On that final day, beloved, precious little girl, beloved, precious young man, on that final day, will your confession hold true? Are you saved? 
And I'm not talking about, well, I think I'm saved. You know, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads unto death. Well, I feel in my heart of my hearts that I'm saved. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you ever read that the heart is deceitfully wicked? Who can know it? Shouldn't you go to the testimony of Scripture? Well, I know I'm saved because my mom, my dad, my pastor, everybody else told me I was saved. Well, I'm telling you this. What does the Word of God tell you? We talk so much about being radical Christians. Radical Christians are not people who jump at concerts. Radical Christians are not people who wear Christian t-shirts. Radical Christians are those who bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Radical Christians are those who reverence and honor their parents even when they feel like their parents are wrong. Radical Christians are those who do not... Now listen to me, this is going to make you mad. Who do... And I'm talking to boys and girls. Radical Christians are those who do not dress sensually in order to show off their bodies. If your clothing is a frame for your face, God is pleased with your clothing. If your clothing is a frame for your body, it's sensual and God hates what you're doing. Everybody wants to talk about a prophet, but no one wants to listen to him. I'm talking about Christianity. I have spent my life in jungles. I have spent my life freezing in the Andes Mountains. I have seen people die. A little boy, Andrew Maimon, the Muslim shot him five times through the stomach and left him on a sidewalk simply because he cried out, I am so afraid, but I can not deny Jesus Christ. Please don't kill me, but I will not deny Him. And he died in a pool of blood. And you talk about being a radical Christian because you wear a t-shirt. Because you go to a conference. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about godliness. I wish. Do you know what a move of God would be in this place if all of you came under conviction? If I myself came under conviction of the Holy Spirit, we fell down on our faces and wept because we watched the things that God hates. Because we wear the things that God hates. Because we act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world. Because we do the very things, and we know not that we do these things because we do not know the Word of God. Because even though we claim as a denomination that the Scriptures are the infallible Word of God, basically all we get is illustration stories and quaint little novels. Oh, that God would blow on this place! That we would turn away from our sin. That we would renounce the things that are displeasing to God. And then that we would run to Him. And we would relish Him. And we would love Him. Oh, that God would raise up missionaries. I don't wish the same things your parents want for you. They want for you security and insurance and nice homes. They want for you cars and respect. I want for you... The same thing I want for my son, that one day he takes a banner, the banner of Jesus Christ, and he places it on a hill where no one has ever placed the banner before. And he cries out, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it costs my son his life. Oh, when he's 18 years old, if he says to me the same thing I said when I was a young man, I'm going into the mountains, I'm going into the jungle, and they say, you can't go there, you're insane, it's a war, you're going to die. I'm going. When that little boy puts on that backpack, I'm going to pray over him and say, go! Go! God be with you. And if you die, my son, I'll see you over there and I'll honor your death. Oh my God, let's pray. Let's pray. Oh God, I don't care about reputation. I don't care what men think. I want you to be honored. I want, I want these young people to be saved. I want those that are saved to stop looking around them at a cultural Christianity that you hate and will spew out of your mouth and that they will look at the Word of God and say, I will follow Jesus. Oh God, I pray for youth ministers and pastors and I pray that You'd fill them with a spirit of wisdom and love and boldness and discernment. And dear God, whatever the cost, I pray that You would raise up missionaries. I can't help but look at these kids and think of my own little boy. 
Oh God, that You would save Ian and that You would raise him up and send him into the worst part of the battle. Oh dear God, raise up missionaries here. Raise up missionaries. Raise up preachers and pastors and reachers and evangelists. And know the Word of God. Oh God, work in this place. Please work in this place, dear God. Please. 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 And with every head bowed, is there anyone here tonight that would say, Brother Paul, I have been living a lie. I claim to be a Christian, but I love the world, and I look like it, and smell like it, and I hate myself for it. And Brother Paul, I am so tired of this Christianity that I'm living. I'm just sick of it. I'm just sick of it. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I just want you to stand up. For the Paul, want to be saved. Amen. Is there anyone else? I want to be saved. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. Those of you who stood up, I'm going to come down here and I want you to meet with me. I want to talk to you. Now, you may be seated. Thank you. Now I want to talk to those of you who claim to be Christians. Does your life honor Jesus Christ? Are you looking in His Word to find out how you're supposed to live? I pray with all my heart. The only thing that's going to save the church in America, there's only two possibilities. One is a total reformation in our preaching and our study of the Word of God. Or the other is fierce, horrifying persecution. That's the only thing that's going to save the church in America. Oh, I pray. I pray that you would return to the Word. I pray. Listen to me, young person. You, you need to know. You need to say, okay, how am I supposed to live before my parents? Go into the Word, find out, obey it. How am I supposed to dress? Go into the Word, find out, and obey it. How am I supposed to talk? What am I supposed to listen to? Bring every thought, word, and deed into subjection to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand. Because I am so tired of people coming forward to make those commitments, and those commitments last in two minutes. I'm not here so that I can write up in my magazine that a gazillion of you came forward. I want you to go home, and I want you to live for Jesus Christ with all your heart. But if you need counseling, you say, Brother Paul, I want to. I want to live for Jesus Christ, but I don't know how. I don't know how. Then in a minute, we're going to give an invitation. I do want you to come forward. Not to make a commitment. You want to make a commitment? You make that commitment right where you're seated. You need to tell somebody, you go tell your pastor. You go tell your youth minister. And you know what? We'll know if that commitment lasts. You know how? Because it will last. We'll know if it's from God. Let me tell you something. For everyone who's here right now, I want to tell you something. If you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you made a decision to get saved in these last two days, I want to tell you something. If it was genuine, it will last. If after a few weeks you go right back into the world, live like the world, act like the world, I want you to know something. You didn't get anything here this weekend. You got emotion. That's about it. If you really got something from the Lord, I want you to know something. It will last. And even if you try to run away from it, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to do it. Oh, I love you so much. I love you so much. I would ask that we all stand. If you need counseling about a decision that you have made, but it's not clear, I want you to come forward. And I'm going to come right down here. Those of you who stood up, there were many of you over there. 
who, who say, I need to know Jesus Christ. I want to come down here right now and I want to meet with you and I want to go back over here with you and some other counselors and I want to talk to you. And I want to tell you something. Not a five-minute deal. Not a ten-minute deal. If you need to talk all night, we will stay. That is the attitude of every counselor in this place. It will stay all night if necessary. All night. God love you. God love you. Let me pray for you. Dear God, please. Lord, there has been so much movement. Last night, Lord, I don't know how much of it was real, but I know that I saw people last night weeping. I saw people trying to make commitments, and I believe that there was a great deal of what happened last night was of you. I saw this morning a young man preach, Father, give his testimony, and I saw real working of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how much of all the decisions were real, but there were some real things going on. And I pray right now, Father, I don't know how much will be real. Only time and eternity will show us that. But oh dear God, please, please work in Jesus' name. Amen. para ser abogado en la Universidad de Texas. Allí en la universidad, todo estaba saliendo muy bien para mí. Mis notas eran muy, muy buenas. Mi carrera estaba, pero casi perfecta. Pero yo era un borracho. Un borracho horrible. ¿Por qué? Cuando yo tenía 17 años, mi papá, que era muy rico, mi papá, y yo estábamos uh, trabajando en el campo con los caballos, porque él tenía como un hobby, uh, él criaba caballos. Y estábamos ahí trabajando y mi papá gritó, y cuando gritó agarré a mi papá y caímos al suelo. Y él estaba muerto. En ese momento yo me di cuenta, yo me, me di cuenta que qué importa si soy rico, voy a morir. Qué importa si soy inteligente, voy a morir. ¿Qué importa si encuentro la mujer de mis sueños también? Voy a morir, ¿no? Como ustedes van a morir. Lo siento por las buenas noticias, malas noticias, pero sí, van a morir. Ahora, entonces yo empecé a pensar, ¿qué importa la vida? Yo fui a la universidad y yo estaba ahí estudiando y todo lo demás, pero sin esperanza, sin esperanza. Pero un día... Un hombre llegó a mi cuarta y, y comenzó a hablarme de Cristo. Y yo pensaba, como ustedes están pensando de mí, que él era loco. Porque qué locura que ha venido a mi puerta a hablarme de Cristo en esos tiempos modernos. ¿No sabe él que estudio en la universidad? Entonces, él empezó a hablar conmigo a mi corazón. Él me dijo, mira chico, tu vida, ¿cómo estás? ¿Estás feliz? No. ¿Por qué? ¿Tienes dinero? Sí. ¿Tienes una familia? Sí. ¿Una buena edu educación? Sí. ¿Por qué no estás feliz? Porque voy a morir. Porque voy a morir. Entonces él, él empezó a abrir la Biblia y hablar conmigo acerca de una persona. La persona de Jesucristo. Ahora, vamos a ver algo. Quiero que todos me escuchen. Con respecto a la persona de Jesucristo, hay tres posibilidades. Solamente tres. Y esta noche tú tienes que decidir quién es Jesús. La primera posibilidad. La primera posibilidad. Cristo era un loco. 
Porque cualquier hombre que dice que es el Hijo de Dios, si no lo es, si lo cree sinceramente, es un loco, ¿no es cierto? Es un loco. Si encontramos un hombre en el parque predicando, diciendo que es el Hijo de Dios, pues es un loco. Pero Jesús decía que era el Hijo de Dios. Hay tres posibilidades. Uno, es un hombre muy sincero, pero es un loco. Otra posibilidad, Jesucristo era mentiroso. Que él sabía que no era el Hijo de Dios y él mentía y engañaba más gente que cualquier otro falso profeta en la historia de la humanidad. Entonces, con la persona de Jesucristo hay tres opciones. Él es loco, él es mentiroso o él es el hijo de Dios. Probablemente muchos de ustedes dicen, bueno, yo creo que Jesús era un buen hombre, pero yo no creo que era, el, el, era hijo de Dios. Pero hay un problema con su lógica. Si no era el hijo de Dios, no era buen hombre, porque un buen hombre no va a mentir y un loco no es un buen hombre. Tú tienes que ver quién es Jesús. Otra pregunta. En todas las iglesias, tú siempre escuchas del Evangelio. Los evangélicos hablan del Evangelio, los católicos hablan del Evangelio, tú hablas del Evangelio. Pero ¿sabes lo que es? ¿Tienes una idea? Todos hablando de Dios y Cristo, pero ¿sabes lo que es el Evangelio? Una vez has entendido, voy a explicar esta noche. Mira, la palabra Evangelio proviene de una palabra latín, evangelicum, y significa buenas o gratas noticias. La única razón por la cual estoy gritando no es porque estoy enojado, es porque pues tengo que gritar, no tengo micrófono. Pero el evangelio no es una mala noticia, buena noticia. Pero empieza así, Dios es justo. Tengo una pregunta. ¿Prefieres que Dios sea injusto o tú quieres un Dios justo? ¿Quién quiere un Dios injusto y malo? ¿Alguien? Nadie. Dios es justo. Tú dices, está bien. No. El hecho que Dios es justo es tu problema más grande. Tu problema más grande es que Dios es justo. Tú dices, ¿por qué es un problema? ¿Por qué? Tú no eres justo. Tú has pecado. La Biblia dice, por cuanto todos pecaron y están destituidos de la gloria de Dios. Has pecado. Tú lo sabes. Yo no tengo que pasar tiempo tratando de convencerte que has pecado. Tú has pecado. Has mentido. Has tenido malos pensamientos. Mira, mira. Si yo pudiera poner tu vida en un DVD y yo pudiera dar una película esta noche de cada pensamiento que has pensado, de cada día de tu vida, tú correrías de este parque y nunca, nunca regresarías, porque tú has hecho cosas tan avergonzosas que no quieres contar a nadie. Es cierto, yo sé es cierto, porque la Biblia dice y porque yo soy como tú. Ahora, Dios es justo, y tú y yo hemos desobedecido a Dios, la ley de Dios. Ahora, el problema más grande en las Escrituras es, ¿cómo puede un Dios justo perdonar al pecador y todavía ser justo? Este es el problema más grande de la Biblia. Les voy a dar una ilustración. Vamos a decir que un delincuente mata a tu familia, y tú lo agarras y lo llevas al juez, y el juez dice al hombre que ha matado a toda tu familia, mira, yo soy un juez de amor, por eso te perdono, estás libre. ¿Cómo, cómo vas a responder? Tú te vas a enojar, tú te vas a gritar, tú vas a gritar, tú vas a escribir a los congresistas, al presidente y todos los demás diciendo que hay un juez que es más corrupto que los criminales que él perdona. Si Dios es 
justo él tiene que satisfacer su justicia. Y la única manera de hacerlo es por medio de castigarte conforme a tus pecados en el infierno, es cierto. Pero la Biblia dice que Dios también es amor. Dios es amor. Entonces Dios ha encontrado una manera de satisfacer la justicia contra ti y salvarte. Es por medio de su Hijo, Jesucristo. En la cruz, primeramente, Jesucristo es más que un hombre. Jesucristo es el Hijo eterno de Dios que llegó a ser hombre por medio de la encarnación, nació de la Virgen María. Caminó sobre la tierra y Jesucristo vivió una vida absolutamente perfecta. Pero según la providencia de Dios, Él fue clavado a una cruz. En la cruz, ahora piensa, ¿qué pasó en la cruz? ¿Qué pasó de verdad? O vamos a escuchar a Jesús. Jesús dijo en la cruz, Dios mío, Dios mío, ¿por qué me has desamparado? Fíjense, ¿qué está pasando en la cruz? El único Hijo de Dios está en la cruz y el Padre lo desampara, lo rechaza. ¿Por qué? Es porque cuando Cristo estaba en la cruz, Él llevó nuestro pecado. Y Dios es santo, Él no puede tolerar el pecado. Entonces... Él, se, él desamparó a Jesús en la cruz y toda la justicia de Dios que tú mereces y yo merezco esta justicia cayó sobre Jesús y cuando Jesús murió Él pagó la pena de nuestros pecados y ahora podemos ser salvos por medio de la fe en Jesús ahora hay muchas personas que están pasando por aquí que dicen que creen que la Biblia es la palabra de Dios. Pero cuando una persona se para en medio del parque predicando la palabra de Dios, ellos piensan, ¡qué raro! ¡Qué locura! Pero no es una locura si de verdad es la palabra de Dios. Todos saben, todos siempre están hablando que Cristo va a venir pronto. Pero no es interesante que nadie, nadie está preparándose que todos los jóvenes y todos los demás están divir, divirtiéndose en el parque y ni piensen en la persona de Jesús. Mira, la hipocresía que hay. Todos dicen Jesús es el Hijo de Dios, pero viven como Jesús nunca hubiera venido. Esta noche, ¿has escuchado el Evangelio? Que Dios de verdad te ama y envió a su Hijo Jesús. Y puedes tener el perdón de tus pecados. Y no solamente esto. Puedes tener una vida nueva. Estoy aquí no porque soy religioso. Estoy aquí porque hace 25 años el Señor cambió mi vida. Una vida horrible. Hay muchos de ustedes que están buscando dinero. Mi familia tiene más. Muchos de ustedes están buscando fama. Yo conozco a muchos que tienen fama. Yo, te, yo puedo decirte algo. No vas a encontrar la felicidad en el dinero. No vas a encontrar la felicidad en la inmoralidad, la diversión. Vas a encontrar la felicidad y la vida solo en la persona de Jesucristo. Ahora voy a bajar. No tienen que tener miedo, no soy tan loco como creen. Si quieren aprender más, pueden acercarse a mí o a cualquier otro que está acá y les voy a hablar de cómo Cristo puede cambiar su vida. Gracias. Y no cuesta nada. Gracias.